gonna call to order a special meeting of the Boulder City Council and the Planning Board. Lynette, you would call the roll. Council Member Brockett. Present. Carlisle. Here. Jones. Here. Morzell. Nagel. Here. Weaver. Here. Yates. Here. Yep. Present. Mayor, we have a quorum. And we'll also note that we have Planning Board mem members. You guys are, oh, there you all are. I was like, where are all of you? Yes, thank you for joining us tonight. A couple of announcements. We're missing a couple. Yeah, can, we can we do introductions? Yeah. Yes, please. Uh, I'm Brian Bowen. I'm currently the chair of Planning Board until these guys usurp me sometime soon. Been on for about seven and a half years. Uh, I'm Sarah Silver, and I am new to the board. I'm Lupita Montoya. I'm also new to the board. My name is Peter Vitali. Uh, I'm Harman Zuckerman, and I am the vice chair of the board until Brian tells me it's not okay. <laughs> <laughs> Great, well, it's a pleasure to have a joint meeting with you. And just a note to the public, um, well, first an announcement. Um, CAC had tried to schedule October 7th as a special meeting. Um, it, it, that's not gonna work, so we're passing around a more thorough pro, po poll for when we can do another special meeting. Um, somewhere up here. Okay, uh, so don't leave tonight without having done that. <coughs> And then with that, um, let's turn to our meeting. Um, this is a special meeting, so we're not having open public comment. And we have just one topic. One topic, a motion to adopt the Alpine Balsam Area Plan. And so my understanding is we're gonna hear a brief presentation, do questions, and then mostly it's to have a public hearing. And then um, when that's over, you guys get to stay and deliberate, and we're going home. And we'll deliberate another evening coming up on October, we don't know yet. Uh, we're scheduling that still. Okay, so with that, I turn it over to whoever on staff. Great, <clears throat> thank you council members and planning board members. Uh, Chris Meschuk with the planning department as well as the city manager's office. And I'm joined tonight by Gene Gatza, the project manager for the Alpine Balsam Area Plan. And we're honored tonight to be presenting um, the final Alpine Balsam Area Plan for consideration of adoption. Um, it has been a, a large investment of time by um, all of you as council members and planning board members and from the community of time and energy in um, working through this area plan. And so we're excited to bring that forward for you tonight. Um, so the purpose for tonight's meeting is to hold a public hearing and to consider adoption of the Alpine Balsam Area Plan. And so we are, it is a little unique in that we have both the planning board and the council um, in the chambers at the same time. And the reason for that is um, both the planning board and the city council have equal decision-making authority on the plan. And so we want you to all hear the same testimony at the same time. So that's why we hold the joint meeting um, in area plans or um, another example of that is the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan is another time that we will do these joint meetings. So. The agenda for tonight is um, we will do the staff presentation um, and then we'll be available for any clarifying questions. We will then open the public hearing. Um, after the public hearing is done, any other follow-up questions before um, we hold a brief recess and that will be for city council to adjourn. Um, we'll reset the room just slightly for the planning board um, and then we'll continue the meeting um, as a planning board meeting um, where the planning board will then deliberate uh, and consider a motion. Um, and then the council um, will reconvene to hold deliberations and a vote. We were thinking maybe uh, October 7th, but that is now to be determined on exactly what the date is. So stay tuned for that. Um, Subcommunity and area plans, as I mentioned, are adopted by both the planning board and the council. Um, and um, so in thinking about the process of this uh, after tonight, um, any revisions that the planning board makes to the plan as a part of their adoption will then come before the city council. Um, and then the city council will consider those changes as well. If there are any differences between the planning board's um, action and the city council's action, then that would need to then return to the planning board for the planning board to consider any of those um, changes that were uh, made by the city council as well. So um, part of this process and 
why we held the hearings that we held in August were really to try and work together to find what are the areas of common ground between the planning board and the city council tonight. One last slide for me is just a little bit of an orientation of um, how does an area plan fit into all of the other planning things that we do in the city? And so you'll see on the outer left-hand side, the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan. That's our guiding policy document for um, the community. Area plans are the next step in, which are still at a higher level, but paint a picture for um, the future vision of an area that's anticipated for change. After an area plan comes things like the land use map and any changes to land use, any changes to zoning. And then that's when we get into detailed site planning of where we actually look at um, either a buy right or a site review or some sort of development project of an, an actual site. So um, that's just an orientation of where we are um, and how an area plan fits into what will be a, an evolution of the area over time. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Jean, who's gonna give the presentation. Thank you, Chris, and good evening, council members and planning board members. As Chris mentioned, we are very excited to be here um, for, the, for the final review of the Alpine Balsam area plan. It's been the culmination of about an 18-month planning process, um, building on an over a year-long process for the vision plan prior to that. Um, and this plan will guide the redevelopment for the city-owned properties and guide improvements for the wider area. So last month, um, the Planning Board and the City Council held public hearings and listened to community members, um, as you have done along with staff throughout this process. You provided feedback to revise the draft that was submitted by staff in August, and the direction you provide showed a lot of compromise. We, decision makers and the staff, have heard people's hopes and fears throughout this project hopes that this project um, and this opportunity would um, make a significant impact on the affordable housing issues that, the, that are so critical with the city right now. Um, hope for an energetic and vital um, new community space and new housing that is beautiful and facilitates connection. But also a lot of fears that the new buildings would be too big or inappropriate, result in the loss of views, or create unintended impacts and consequences. This plan represents a balance um, of those hopes and fears. You've made choices to take things a little slower, pausing on the land use changes for the nearby area and focusing only on the city-owned properties. Choices that ensure a variation of housing types that will facilitate affordable projects, being very strategic about the location of buildings um, that, would that would be allowed over three stories and you've consistently supported an innovative approach for access and mobility. This isn't a project <coughs> where there's a solution that will make everyone happy. But this final plan reflects choices made to address community values, compromise, and vision. As I mentioned, this has been a project process with several phases of community engagement, numerous studies, um, many meetings with community members, prop, uh, property owners, advisory boards and commissions, and meetings with the planning board and the city council. Tonight will be the second public hearing. And as suggested by the city council, our staff members met with folks from several community groups who have been involved in the process throughout um, for the purposes of walking through the plan, also ensuring understanding of what is really included in the recommendations for land use and urban design, and for sharing the direction that was provided by the city council. In the next few slides, I'm gonna outline the changes to the draft plan that were um, based on the feedback from the Planning Board and Council. Um, as I mentioned, the plan includes land use changes only for the city-owned properties. Outline, those are, these are outlined by that dashed white line. The properties with private ownership will keep their current land use designations and zoning. Redevelopment or renovation um, remains as it is today. For these areas, this means that there's limited development potential or incentive to redevelop, and all by right development would need to meet uh, the standards for current zoning. And the area plan doesn't change the current process for historic preservation, but just to clarify, for any of the buildings that are over 50 years, if properties come in for redevelopment or um, re renovation of their own accord, our normal process would apply and would trigger the review and consideration of landmarking. The planning board made a recommendation to swap the in, um, intensity and density of the um, west block and the center block. 
um, to encourage um, both uh, retail adjacent to the park and, and some ground, ground floor retail adjacent to the park and um, a little more intensity on the west side. The city council did not support this recommendation, citing the desire to keep the approach of cascading density from, the, from Broadway outward and that this idea had not had the benefit of um, the wider public review. Also, we have adjusted the building height map so that it focuses only on the city-owned properties, outlining um, up to three stories with the additional height above 35 feet for pitched roof forms um, in the um, green area. And then the pink is up to four stories and up to five stories for the pavilion building and the parking structures should that um, be found to be advantageous to add additional floor to those existing structures. The urban design map and connections plan remain focused on the entire planning area. These outline the key improvements, both for capital improvements, connections, or improvements desired through re redevelopment. Both the City Council and the Planning Board suggested that we um, continue the multi-use path connection uh, east of Broadway along Balsam to th um, 13th Street, and this connection has been added. And then the Planning Board um, recommended adjusting the descriptions of the land use prototypes to focus more on the quality of the public realm, the building form, and less on the dwelling units per acre. So there are some adjustments in the wording in the land use prototypes. And then um, both the Planning Board and the City Council provided direction to explore, to further continue to explore relocation of the Boulder County to Alpine Balsam dependent on the draft criteria. That criteria is now included in the plan and um, the city staff and the Boulder County staff have been working to clarify the next steps analysis needed and um, to set up the working group that has been, was recommended by the city council. So for the benefit of the community members watching and a refresher for council and the board, I'd like to just quickly walk through the key elements of the city site. So for the east block, it's the renovation of the medical pavilion and a new public plaza, a <coughs> mixed-use hatched area on the north, north corner of Balsam and Broadway um, is mixed-use, keeping the flexibility for this to be a future mix of um, potentially either civic uses or housing or just housing. On the center block is the, the northern portion is the three-story stacked flats that would allow for um, some differences in roof forms, um, potentially above 35 feet, and four-story housing as stacked flats or the potential for the relocation of Boulder, Boulder County. Oh, I'm sorry, did I not get that one? <coughs> Next one. There it is. Okay. Um, the relocation of Boulder County services on that lower par portion of the center block. On the west block, it is for um, townhomes, more housing in, the, in a more of a townhome style, um, under 35 feet. We have the flood mitigation, flood mitigation and greenway along the northern section of the site along Balsam. Multi-use um, linear parks and multi-use paths um, through, throughout the site, the new street connection at 11th and bike and ped connections um, through the east, east west through the site along with the new mobility plaza. And then shared parking in the um, existing structure. So all in all, um, a lot of improvements, um, a cohesive design that offers a lot of connection and variability within housing um, to create a, a new wonderful space. Our next steps include developing an implementation plan that will be more specific regarding the analysis and studies needed, phasing, improvements, and financing. Our longer term next steps um, include the ongoing deconstruction of the hospital, um, capital improvements planning, and um, a lot more uh, detailed design and implementation work. When the plan is adopted and the work of implementation begins, we will continue the work to address the concerns and seek innovation, innovative solutions building on the values and the goals outlined in the plan. It is our team's hope and intention that as we do this work, our staff and community members will continue to listen to each other and potentially heal some of the fear and anger and build more connections within our community, both for the current residents and employees um, for, of the area, as well as our future community members. 
With that, um, staff recommends um, that tonight the planning board consider a motion to adopt the plan as presented in the memo and the city council consider the same um, when you re reconvene um, on this topic. Great, thank you so much. That was very helpful. Questions? I have Bob and Sarah. Thanks for that. Um, I'm looking at the um, criteria for the potential co-location by the county. It was on page 14. Um, and specifically looking at criterion number three about the parking garage. Maybe I missed this along the way, but um, what kind of jumped out at me is the discussion about an additional level of parking on top of the existing parking garage. Was that always part of the, the deal? For the, for the county relocation, we think that that will be needed. And if the county doesn't relocate there, we won't need it? Probably not. We, th we think it initially that we would be able to meet um, the shared parking between the civic uses and the housing um, with the current structure. And um, I'm not gonna ask you a cost question because that's probably unfair, but how many additional parking spaces would that additional floor bring? Roughly 60. And that parking garage actually was designed to be able to carry, or it was, it's able to carry another, another floor if, if it was needed. So remind me again, it's, it's four stories and it would go to, f well, I know parking garage is kind of hard to measure. <laughs> How many feet is it? <laughs> it would have to be under 55 feet. So it just take it up close to 55? Yeah. The extra deck, okay, thanks. Sir. Uh, so when I was reading through the package, I was struck uh, by a somewhat of a, what I observed to be a disconnect between the language of the package, about 45 feet or 35 feet, and the language of the, um, the uh, sorry, the land use prototypes, and I'm, which allow on um, at least two of the blocks to go up to 55 feet. And I'm just curious, um, how that inconsistency gets resolved. I can give you an, I mean, I can yes. give you an example. That would be so, would be great. Um, in the Northeast block, it's written as 45 feet, but the proposed land use prototype of MU2 allows 55 feet. Um, so, uh, and, and because in the implementation process, portion of the memo, you talk about possible um, changes to the height map. I'm just wondering if we're gonna find ourselves back here having another conversation about height because the community thought it was gonna be 45 and through site review, someone's requesting 55. Yeah, I think, um, if we look at the way mixed use two is described, so I'm on page 27 of the plan. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it describes, th this area applies um, in several areas. So I think it's describing in general what the prototype is. Mm -hmm. If we were to have a development project come in, say for that area, um, we would look to the height map in the plan to give us the guidance for that building form. So there may be, the land use prototype might apply to several geographic areas, but the height map is really what's gonna give us the guidance related to building height. And then that would be reflected in the zoning for that parcel as Wait, well. Wait, gotta speed and, up. And that would be reflected for the zoning in that for that parcel as well. Okay, so, so the, all right, so we'll so get into it when together. we, all right, I just wanted to raise that. Could I, I, yeah, I just wanted to call up on that question. Um, any possibility for form-based code would be one way of resolving it, and that is something that m could happen as we move forward. Is we that we can explore? We, we intend to explore that. So we so we could um, it could be resolved that way with in, with intention. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, okay, but now I'm confused. So on 27, where it says characterized by buildings up to four stories. But it could be five stories in this case. I think that that's not what you're saying. Might, might need to go <clears throat> to 55 feet, but it would still be four stories, depending on the area. So where's the height map, Chris, what page? Yeah. So that's the distinct, dis, what's being distinguished, stories versus feet? 
Page 31. What page? 31. This is a question for me. Um, I've only ever seen um, five-story buildings as hotels. Are there other, what other types of buildings could be um, five stories? There are, there's, <clears throat> it has to do with the size of the floor plates of the building, the height from the floor to the ceiling, and in a lot of commercial buildings or even a lot of commonly, um, especially more recent residential buildings, you want a bit of a taller floor plate. So a lot of times we only see four story buildings. Um, if you do shorter floor plates, you can get five stories in. Um, it is typically more of a residential setting, either a hotel or if you wanna do residential with lower ceilings, that's really the only time we've ever seen buildings that get a full five stories. And I'm gonna look to Kalani and see if there's anything else to add. Kalani of the Planning Department. Chris is right, and we were looking if, you're talking about the five stories for the pavilion? No, I'm just, um, in general, just about, about using the language of stories versus using the language of height, and. I think we wanted flexibility for the, so if you, if we look at a mixed use building, we want a taller floor to ceiling on the first floor for retail uses. They need a little bit higher ceilings if they're gonna do commercial kitchen kind of things, ventilation. And then if there's office above, it can have shorter floor, um, floor to ceiling heights. But we're also kind of planning for if there was any kind of roof form in there too. We didn't want to, it's hard to put a number sh on that and say that's going to be 45 feet or that's going to be 55 feet and talk more about floors, strictly floors. So does that help? So it's, it's it, in terms of providing that flexibility, it is easier to talk about floors? Yeah, I think it is easier to talk about floors in that sense, especially if we're also looking for some pitch roof forms in there too, to talk about floors rather than um, 35 foot mark, 45 foot mark, okay. 55 foot mark in okay. that sense. But typically we see those on the hotels when you're trying to get the five floors in or a commercial building that, like the pavilion, where we're working with floor to ceiling heights that are a little bit shorter and we can fit a fifth floor in. Okay, okay that thank you, that's helpful. Okay, I got a bunch of hands here. So Sam, Cindy, no, Sam and Cindy, okay. So I think this is a pretty nice way to do it. You've got the um, very clear markings on the uh, height map that say, here's the limits for height unless there are roof form, you know, interesting roof forms, which we've talked about wanting as opposed to just square buildings. So I believe that this <coughs> guidance when combined with the number of stories in the prototypes gives some pretty clear guidance. I mean, there's not, there's like one place there can be a five story building on the whole um, site and that's good. And then there's a bunch of places where there can be either three or four story buildings, which marches back towards the park <coughs> and the neighborhoods getting to three story, but we preserve the option for reforms. And I think that that, will give guidance to planning board when you have a project in front of you talking about reforms. And can I call a quick real quick? Yeah. I mean, more than just guidance, I think one of our criteria in the site review, right, is that uh, is, it, is a project compatible with an area plan? So if somebody came in with a four-story proposal where three stories are in the height map, it would be found to be incompatible with the area plan and therefore not supportable. Fair? Exactly. That's exactly correct, and that's why we thought actually there was some, <clears throat> some really good um, uh, guidance that the area plan could give related to height based on the conversation that we had with um, the community about wanting to see um, more variability in roof forms. We heard that feedback from council and planning board members as well. So we thought this was a great way to describe that policy intention and direction in the area plan. We'll then work on articulating that through zoning, but it'll also then help us in getting guidance as development projects come in. Cindy. So, <clears throat> so I would just hope though that we would be clear, Chris, you mentioned the community, that because there is still, I mean, 55 feet is 55 feet, and um, if it is represented as being four stories, it's 
that's a lot of roof form. So the, the thing that I would be concerned about is that there is really clarity surrounding this, that because the city has been so conscious about height, building height for so long, that the floors doesn't become a way of just sort of easing things in that actually have to do with height, which is more of a comment, but. <laughs> yes, indeed. <coughs> Any other questions? I was just wondering if someone could sort of unpack a bit uh, what was on page 63 about intending to approach the housing development at Alpine Balsam the same way the city approached 30 Pearl. I just wasn't really, I didn't understand, I didn't know what that referred to. Sure, maybe I'll start and then if there's others who wanna chime in, feel free. Um, what, what we're really referring to is it was the city's ability at 30 Pearl as the landowner to really be able to guide the redevelopment. We said, here's the type of units that we wanna see. Um, and we were able to achieve at 30 Pearl a mixture of rental for sale, um, transitional housing, housing for um, folks with disabilities. So we were able to um, achieve a really great mix of housing. Um, because we were the landowner. And so I think that's what we're trying to say is, because we're the landowner in this situation, um, we can be able to guide that redevelopment in a similar way where it may be through um, some partnership with folks in our community um, or um, other housing developers to be able to achieve the outcomes that, that we've articulated in the plan. Sam. I think also to emphasize <clears throat> is we got a very high level of affordability at 30 Pearl. So it's a little more than 50%. And we have um, affordable commercial space there as well. So it's our first try at deed restricted affordable commercial space. So there were just a lot of elements that got brought in that are elements that we were looking for at 30 Pearl. And it was the process that got us there, which was for the landowner, there's a master developer and whoever the master developer is, you know, kind of subs out and we sell off one block or maybe part of another block to a private developer in order to finance the um, affordable development. So I think 30 Pearl we're kind of looking at as a, it, it seems like it's gonna work out really well. We'd like to see more of that. Bob. So that prompts in my mind uh, another question, a related question. Um, I know that we're, we're teeing this up as a, with optionality on the Alpine side as far as either the county building or potentially housing. To what extent is there a dependency on house, housing on Alpine <laughs> I mean, as it relates to housing and the rest of the site? In other words, do you need to know that at some point in time as far as streets and infrastructure and sewer and water and transportation, all those things, you're gonna need to know that I assume at some point in time before you get too far down the path on housing to the north and to the west. Yeah, we're gonna need to know that pretty quickly because it will affect the parking for the rest of the site. Okay, the and for the rest of the site. it's pretty quickly like three months, six months, 12 months? Um, before we go too much further than planning the rest. Like mid middle of next year? Okay, thanks. Yeah, I think that'd be helpful in terms of a lot of the layout of the site. Right. The way we've designed the kind of block pattern um, from an infrastructure standpoint works whether it's housing or it's um, uh, a county office building, but parking is really the key one that is, um, uh, we've got to figure that out. So it's, it's obviously the parking garage, but there's other parking dependencies as well? Correct. Okay, thanks. Yeah, for the remaining housing on the site, if it's a county use. Got it, okay, thanks. And so in terms of getting <clears throat> to that place within six months, you talked a little bit, there's a subcommittee that's working with the county, right? and. I think it's useful to also just talk to us about the, the next steps or the timing of what might happen at the Irish site and how connected or linked or not that process is. So we're um, still working with the county staff to f scope um, the analysis and the process to come to um, an understanding of all of the different pieces of criteria. We intend to, um, the co county has identified uh, Commissioner Elise Jones as the um, working me work member for the working group, as well as Frank Alexander, uh, the head of their um, public health department. And, um, and we will ant anticipate setting up those meetings um, in the next, in the, in the coming weeks, 
to outline the, the process and scope and analysis needed um, to come to con come to some conclusions about each of those criteria. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. So then a follow-up question to that. Um, does the county staff or maybe even the county commissioners agree with the criteria on page um, 14 or whatever? Yes, or no? and, we, and we, had been work, we had been working with them to develop those into the draft plan. Page, I'm sorry, 14. So they, they agree with the criteria? Yeah. Okay, great, thanks. Sam? Mm -mm. Oh, that wasn't me. Other questions? Mary. So, um, Jean, thanks for responding to my question regarding what could happen without the changes at the um, community plaza and um, the ideal market shopping centers. And just to be clear, the, um, the changes that could happen could be housing there, correct? Because it's the BC2 zone. Correct. Under the BC2 zone, and under in my understanding, um, there you can't have housing on the ground floor. Right. But there could be some housing above. It would need to meet all setbacks, parking, open space, and other requirements that are somewhat limited for that zone. Okay. And um, and the community plaza in particular would have to go through a site review amendment <coughs> because. They Correct. went through the site review. It was a site yeah. review in the 90s, and it would need to be uh, amend a site review, plus it's um, of, a, of a, over two acres, so it would require that. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I have one more question, just again, I think it's useful to say these things out loud. So we talked about 30 Pearl and how that feels like a good project, over 50% affordability, affordable commercial, determining how much affordability we can get on this site and whether we can also require affordable commercial. Can you just talk about the factors and the process to determine that? Because I think that's sort of a key element for folks. Uh, Kurt Fernhauer, Director of Housing and Human Services. So there's um, a number of factors um, that are involved with that until we get further in the process. It's too early to come up, up with that now. So um, things like height, density, um, size of buildings, um, that has an impact, cost of infrastructure, land, um, those also have a, a, a relate to the, to, the, to the overall cost. Also the, um, um, Sam talked about, you know, certain components being market, um, and um, if we can, you know, the value we can get out of that property would, would impact the amount of affordable housing. Um, Another impact is um, whether it's rental or ownership, um, as well as the type of AMIs that we're trying to reach. Typically, if you have a, a bigger variety of, of AMIs, um, then it will take, um, you, you normally get less units or you have to put more money into the project. Um, so the lower AMIs we wanna hit would also take more resources. So it's a mix of AMIs, units, unit types, um, and um, uh, I, so I don't know if that helps. No, it does. I just think it's useful to spell it out and sure. sort of where in the process that gets figured out in, in the next st stage, I think is also useful for people to know. I think the project has to develop further and more questions need to be answered, then we can do that. Okay. You'll, you I'll also remind you that that, pr that process was done at 30th and Pearl um, probably three years ago. Um, and we had enough detail at that point and we brought forward options to city council um, of different AMIs, ownership, rental, percentages of each, townhomes, condos, and all those factors um, played into certain trade-offs um, on the site. So we could go through a similar process on this um, as well. Great. So I just wanna translate something you said for people watching who may not speak housing speak so much, but AMI is area median income, so it's what kind of targets we're after for income level. I know everyone here knows that, but just for people watching. <laughs> Thank you. Cindy? So <clears throat> since we're talking about 30th and Pearl, um, I wondered if someone might, I, know, I don't know if it's you, Kirk, or if it's Chris or Jean, talk about the difference in terms of neighborhood of those two areas. So what 30th and Pearl was in terms of being co-located with, as opposed to um, this area at Alpine Balsam. 
Yeah, I think that the typologies of <coughs> um, 30 Pearl and Boulder Junction and Alpine Balsam, they're, they're different typologies in terms of building forms, density. Um, the area in Boulder Junction was intended to be <coughs> transit oriented, <coughs> excuse me, transit oriented development um, that is adjacent to a major transit center. Um, and so the, the character and the density of those buildings is, is different than what we anticipate at Alpine Balsam where um, we have buildings with um, roof forms and um, that we still need to make sure we accommodate um, parking similar to how we accommodate parking um, in other areas of the city while still trying to meet our transportation master plan goals. Um, and so they are, they're, they're not apples to apples areas. And, and I was specifically trying to get to what it was that was surrounding 30th and Pearl. I mean, what kind of zoning that had been or what kinds of uses were there as opposed to the Alpine Balsam area. Oh, got it, good point, is um, when we did the Transit Village area plan, what we now call Boulder Junction, um, that was an area that was really primarily focused as industrial. Um, and so it had everything from um, car dealerships to manufacturing. Um, and so the setting in that area was really transforming an area um, pretty significantly versus this site, this is more of um, an area that is a site that is going to change with the <coughs> departure of the hospital but it's surrounded by a pretty stable and high functioning neighborhood. And so that's why this area plan has um, different recommendations in it than say what you saw in Boulder Junction. Thank you, thank you, Chris. <laughs> okay, anything else? Okay, why don't we turn to the public hearing? How many people do we have signed up? Fourteen, are you gonna? Display them or hand them to me? Okay, so um, we have 14 folks signed up, it sounds like. Um, You'll have three minutes apiece. If you can start with your name and address or at least what neighborhood you're from or if you're from Boulder, that would be very helpful. And if you can queue up so we can be efficient, that would be great. And we will start with Barbara. Four more, that's all right. Um, and Mariella will be next. She can be ready. All right, greetings everyone. I'm here tonight to speak on behalf of 1,113 people who signed a petition for a more modern plan for Alpine Balsam. This petition was sponsored by Think Boulder, as many of you know. Think Boulder was organized in 2018 by a group of citizens in response to the many redevelopment projects being proposed across the city. Think Boulder's mission is to promote a more considered community-based approach to Boulder development. The Alpine Balsam project came to our attention as one needing broader community input. To do this, Think Boulder developed a scientifically sound survey that generated 533 respondents from across the city, and 55% of those were from outside the neighborhood. Results showed that 78% opposed the high density scenario for Alpine Balsam that includes four and five story buildings. Based on these results, Think Boulder created a petition about the Alpine Balsam area plan that has now been signed by 1,113 citizens. Responses came from across the city with about 60% outside Newlands, the neighborhood. This response shows strong support for the key principles included in the petition. These principles are, number one, permanently fix building heights at 35 feet maximum, number two, include permanently affordable housing for low and moderate income residents. Number three, require 0.95 parking spaces per unit as used at Boulder Junction. As you know, many citizens testified at the public hearing on August 27th. The overwhelming majority of testify, excuse me, testifiers supported Think Boulder's key <coughs> principles that I just listed. 
We appreciate that after the testimony, council directed staff to meet with us and others to further refine the plan. We are pleased that the proposed land use code changes for the area have been taken out of the revised plan, but not for the city owned area. However, the proposed height limits of four stories on most of the site and up to five stories on the pavilion and parking lot have not been changed. Because it is the same height and density as before, we oppose this draft plan. We believe that the 1,113 citizens who have said no to the height and density in this plan are representative of a large majority of Boulder citizens. We urge City Council and Planning Board to vote no on this plan. We ask that the council direct staff to return with an Alpine Balsam plan that follows the key principles of 35 feet height maximum, permanently affordable housing, and 0.95 parking spaces per unit. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Mar Mariella? Okay, um, Tim Eaton. And after Tim, if Francois could be ready. Uh, my name is Tim Eaton, 2727 4th Street, Boulder. Um, so I've lived at that address for 41 years. And the Newlands neighborhood I, I've lived in used to be mostly ranch and bungalow type homes. But over the years, many have been scraped off and turned into large, expensive ones. I'm concerned that much, much of the economic diversity of the neighborhood has been lost. And this is true of Boulder as a whole. It seems. That it seems like it's easy to get people riled up about tall buildings and traffic and parking, but it's really the people who live here who give Boulder its character. So I support the staff's plan for between 210 and 260 units at Alpine Balsam, because this will provide for more affordable housing than other less dense plans considered. I know some neighbors are concerned that they might lose some views or have to wait, have to wait in line for coffee longer, but I ask you to think about and put yourselves in the shoes of the people who could be our new neighbors, the nurses, the teachers, the service workers, who would like to live in Boulder near their jobs, seniors who would like to remain in the neighborhood, people with disabilities who have mobility issues. It's easy to say, let them live out east or somewhere else for whatever reason. But it only seems fair that every neighborhood in Boulder should do its part as we try to create more affordable housing and to really support our values of economic diversity and being an inclusive community. So let's work together to address Boulder's affordable housing and climate crisis goals by using all the tools available to us, including denser development at appropriate locations like Alpine Balsam. Thank you. Thank you. Our second speaker is here now. Uh, yeah, I know. I, I, thank you. Uh, Mariella Colvin, and then um, we'll go to Francois Poinsett. Hello, my name's Mariella. Um, I would like to say that I have been living for over 20 years now uh, within a block and a half of the Balsam Alpine location, and um, I did not find it to be uh, a hindrance at all when the hospital was there and the traffic that it generated was not a problem for me at all, even though I commute by it uh, every workday. Um, and I understand that the plan that the staff has put forward would generate less traffic than the hospital traffic. So I just think the whole traffic objection is um, a red herring. I also want to say that I'm in favor of affordable housing. Um, I think it makes the neighborhood more diverse, more interesting. Our neighborhood has changed over the years, and I think it's for the worse. Um, people don't... Uh, come out of their houses very much. I look forward to a kind of uh, plan where that will encourage community engagement and public um, interaction and, uh, and make the neighborhood uh, a little more vibrant, a little more interesting. Um, I'm sure I have many other comments to make, but since I just got here, <laughs> I will spare you the speeches and just stop at that. Thank you. Thank you. Francoise Poinsett and then Kathleen McCormick. Hello, everyone. 
Um, just want to come here tonight to fully support the staff plan and with the maximum density. Um, and I've been here speaking before. I'd like to push back a little bit about what I'm hearing from Think Boulder. I saw some of their surveys and I thought they're somewhat like push polls. I also have to say, I think tonight you're gonna to be hearing from a lot of folks who have been through this neighborhood with a lot of different transitions. And we've seen the really big transition from the original Newlands neighborhood from humble little houses to complete scrape offs and demolition. So when we talk about neighborhood character, which neighborhood character are we discussing? Um, on, when I first moved to the Alpine Balsam site, it was in 1985, I lived in those little tiny micro units which you don't, you probably wouldn't call them, like, that's what I didn't call them back then, but it was like about 300 square feet. Lived there with my newlywed husband and our big collie dog and 300 square feet right across from Alpine, they're still there. That is the neighborhood character. And we uh, lived there, never drove our cars, and we, c we really wanted to buy in the neighborhood, got very lucky in 1989, and have been able to live in this neighborhood and profit from not hardly ever having to drive our cars. I mean, we put hardly any miles on this, and I do go to Denver regularly. I do this, all the things people say you can't do, but can because we've lived in this neighborhood. I guarantee, I've heard people talk about waiting, you know, the lines getting long at Ideal Market if we put too many people here. Well, what about the employees at Ideal Market? What about the employees at the Met Boulder Medical Center? Do we want to actually be able to do a functional housing, make this into a vibrant community hub? I do, I think it can be really great, and I think we need to think about the investment the city of Boulder, the people of Boulder, community-wide have made, um, which comes out by our calculations here, and I'm gonna have to put my glasses on, anyway. It's about $400 a person from what I can calculate with a, you know, about uh, per person. So we really have to look at community-wide benefits. We have to get very serious about our climate emergency that we have, and this is the definition of good compact development on the transit nodes. It has every kind of restaurant, cafe, medical center, um, uh, pharmacy, you name it credit unions right there and allows people to live with a far less car intensive lifestyle. And the park is right there, so please consider this, the staff plan is a compromise in my mind and I truly hope that you go with this and create a beautifully designed, vibrant neighborhood. It's frankly been very dull and drab since the Boulder Community Hospital moved out. I walk down there and it's just hot, there's nothing there. And that's not the neighborhood I wanna see and I don't wanna see more fancy luxury condos either. I really feel like we need a good design, thank you. Thank you. Kathleen McCormick and then David Cook. Uh, good evening, I'm Kathleen McCormick. Um, I've lived in Boulder for 26 years, about two blocks from the Alpine Balsam site. Um, we had our son there in the hospital. Um, my husband and I, about a month or two after we moved to Boulder to Newlands, we and a group of friends that have been friends for all this time now, helped start the Newlands Neighbor, uh, Neighborhood Association. And that association was dedicated to creating community among the 1,400 households in the Newlands neighborhood. And these are people who live in apartments, micro units, as well as single family homes. This, this is our neighborhood, it's all kinds of housing. Um, that uh, Newlands Neighbors Association led to the founding of the EcoPass program. A couple of people from our group work with RTD on that. So a lot of you know environmental commitment came out of this group, this neighborhood group, and these are some of the folks who are speaking in favor of the plan tonight. I would ask you to adopt this plan. I, I would like to see the staff's plan for 200 to 250 affordable homes be in, um, installed on this site. The plan allows for a variety of housing sizes and types from studio apartments for millennials to stacked flats for seniors who might wanna downsize, maybe some even some folks from our own neighborhood. Um, townhouses for young families. Um, I'd like to see affordable homes for teachers, city employees, artists, nonprofit and service workers. The plan complements the types and uses of buildings um, directly adjacent to it. 
And so I feel that it's, it's very complementary and would create a much more active urban hub for us. Um, the, it's, a, it's the 15 minute neighborhood that we describe in our comp plan. This is it. City Council has declared a climate emergency and says it wants diversity and inclusion. This plan addresses both by reducing our carbon footprint and offering homes for people who, who would, like to to, would like to live in Boulder as well as work here. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you. David and then Carolyn Young. Uh, Mayor, members of council and planning board, uh, thank you for all of the service to the community and the diligent work done by staff on this project over the last several years. Um, my name is David Cook. I live at Fifth and Delwood. I've been there for 30 years. This is within the half mile area of influence of the project. Um, as was mentioned earlier, I was part of a group of neighbors who started the Newlands Neighbors Association in 94. Uh, and the Neighborhood EcoPass program there in 95, I advocated before the RTD board in favor of creating that program. Um, I want to call your attention, uh, maybe something you haven't heard, um, to the bus stop on Broadway across the street from IDL and Pharmaca. It is served by three bus routes and it displays the memorial plaque of Janet Roberts. Most of you do not need reminding that public transit functions at its best when more people can easily walk to a bus stop. I'm here to ask you to support and vote in favor of the staff proposal for the Alpine Balsam site. I find the staff proposal to be in keeping with the Boulder Comp Plan, the city's community sustainability, transportation and parking plans, and in keeping with the character of the neighborhood. If you look to the housing immediately across from the Alpine Balsam mega block, you will find that 8% of the units are single family and 92% are multi-story, multi-family units. Many of the housing units to be constructed at Alpine Balsam would be, in terms of size, roughly in keeping with the character of the many bungalows originally built in Newlands. Adding back these smaller housing units to the neighborhood would be a step toward reestablishing the earlier, more affordable and more economically diverse character of the Newlands neighborhood. Please vote to support the staff proposal for Alpine Balsam. Thanks. Uh, we have a question for you. Hey David, thanks for coming out tonight. Um, that uh, 9% and, uh, excuse me, 8% and 92%, what's the geography of, the, of that? I was looking ac across the street from the mega block. Uh -huh. So that takes in, um, there are five single family homes along Balsam. Mm -hmm. There is, across the intersection, there is a, I don't know if it's a condominium, <laughs> um, across Broadway and Balsam that I believe has 12 or 15 units. I didn't bring the numbers with me. <coughs> uh, and then if you go down to the opposite corner of uh, Ninth and Alpine, there are three units of multifamily housing on, they all look like they're on Alpine. The, the last one is actually addressed on 9th. There are two, six units, and then another one is, I believe, 15. Across that intersection, there's a six unit, and then s straight across 9th, there is a um, 21 unit apartment uh, or condo building, I believe, so that adds up to the numbers are five um, and 53. Great, thanks a lot. And there is one new multifamily, multi-story building going in directly across the street from the hospital. As well. Yeah, I think we're familiar with that. But one. I didn't count. That's yeah. the luxury nice. one. Okay, thank you, David. Um, Paul Saparito. In, in your, she crossed off. Um, you're pooling with two people. Could they raise their hands? David and Alina. Okay, great. I've you got have some pretty pictures to show. Uh, how do we do that? Um, she'll set you up. Oh, I push the button? Works. Oh, half. Don't push the red. It, yeah, I was going to say it works half the time. <laughs> so I push. Uh, I'm sorry. Very good. Thank you. And you'll have five minutes. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm pushing, where do I go? No, oh, ec there we go, Echo. Uh, I'm Paul Saperito, I live at 2765 7th Street, I'm a neighbor. 
Uh, I am also an architect. I've uh, practiced architecture and uh, urban design and taught architecture and urban design here and in Europe. Uh, quickly, uh, um, the city plan, uh, urban design plan, uh, we expanded upon that uh, based on that plan and tried to create uh, for uh, neighborhood discussion uh, a, a form-based plan that you see there. And we base that on, am I pushing something? Where do I aim this? Over there. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, no, I'm, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to change. Can you forward it? Um, half the time it doesn't work. Ah. Um, so maybe you guys can forward his slides. Can I just say next and you go forward? Mm -hmm. Except for. Do three people get seven minutes or five minutes? Yeah, there we go. We base this upon uh, uh, row housing, uh, 18th and 19th century row housing. Uh, and uh, the, the point here is simply that the housing is consolidated as well as the open space consolidated so that uh, unlike the single family suburban developments that we see where everyone has their little yard, we get a much higher number of people uh, uh, benefiting from a, a, a larger piece of land. Uh, next, please. There you go. So uh, in detail, uh, we have the cascading densities. We bring the grid down of, uh, of blocks and streets uh, uh, from the neighbors to the north. The alleys run through. We have permeability on the site. We have an east-west connection uh, uh, from Broadway all the way back through the park. Uh, we continue the urban drainage way along Balsam. Uh, we have some civic uh, 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 work in the northeast corner. And uh, next, please. Uh, this is uh, three-story housing, and it should be simple to point out that, uh, simply point out that uh, uh, in this sort of arrangement, uh, one doesn't really care the number of units, the number of bedrooms, the degree of consanguinity, uh, that, that this varies over time. And uh, uh, next, please. And this is four-story stuff, and I should point out simply that uh, dis despite the sort of scary block diagrams that we've seen, uh, this is probably more likely what we would get there. And it's an intricately detailed and finely grained affair. Next, please. Um, the whole secret to doing a form-based plan is that the unit count doesn't really uh, necessarily uh, take, um, uh, need to be considered at this point because we could stack and pack, as you can see in the lower piece there. Townhouses, three flats, uh, four to six uh, uh, studio apartments. And that upper image there, I had a fantasy of three o'clock one morning that uh, one could also uh, do an extremely expensive but a very tiny uh, 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 penthouse apartment that pays for the, uh, uh, the more affordable units underneath. Next, please. <coughs> And one final thought here is uh, this is uh, 136th Street uh, between 5th and 6th Avenue in Harlem and the upper image there. And what you see is uh, a number of uh, smaller developers involved. And uh, in the lower images there, you see what that results in, which is uh, in interest and degree of fine grain uh, fabric on the street uh, that uh, is would not have, would not occur if we went and got six uh, Texas donuts on the site. And finally, um, I would urge you to approve the city plan. Yeah, next one. Uh, because uh, it, it provides flexibility at this point. We should uh, perhaps go to uh, uh, various uh, uh, community builders and, and housing uh, organizations and get uh, financially uh, linked proposals uh, at some later date, uh, and the unit count, uh, uh, the affordability, et cetera, et cetera, uh, is uh, to be determined at that time. We did that at Washington School, uh, in which uh, proposals were received by uh, uh, the city and reviewed at that time. I have no more to say. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. I think we have questions. some questions. Yeah, this was all very interesting. I love the pictures. Thank you very much. Um, 
on this lower right diagram, what is the green blob uh, in the, the ah, uh, that, <laughs> that is uh, what fills up two or three times in the summer. And uh, it's mostly park, but it does get wet. Just wanting to make sure and emphasize to everybody listening that it's not part of our plan to do detention in North Boulder that, Park. That's, uh, I'm just saying that that's the way it drains. No, I understood, thank you. That's okay, any other questions? Uh, yeah, sir? Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry. Please. Um, so I was struck uh, by the, um, what the relative uh, smallness of the unit, and uh, not the units, but the buildings themselves compared to what's proposed for MU2, which are apartment buildings basically, um, or solid buildings um, that fill up a block. What would have to change in these land use prototypes for this design to be possible? The, the, the land use you're, prototypes. You're concerned, that you're, you're concerned that they're too small? No, 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 <laughs> no. Uh, you've, you've proposed something here that is not the same as what the land use prototype uh, suggest in the... In yeah, the, no, no. Uh, so what would have to change in the land use prototypes for the northeast block and the block that's currently could, could be um, county in order to get this? Uh, nothing really. Um, it, it, the northeast block, uh, what we have there is essentially four stories, which would fit very easily in the 45 feet. And all the rest of the project to the west, the lighter shade, is uh, 35 foot. And that's, as you can see in that middle left diagram there, uh, you could get three stories and a whole different number of units. So I've got, uh, I think, 78 25-foot lots, which is a San francisco size lot. Mm -hmm. And within that, you could have either 78 single-family townhomes. You could have uh, three times that amount in three flats high, or uh, as much as so. The point is I could get, uh, the developers can propose to you anywhere between 78 plus alley houses of about 30. Uh, so 100 to almost 550 units. I'm hoping, of course, that there will be a mix of those. Mm -hmm. But uh, so the two or 300 units that are uh, proposed in the plan can, can work in this. And there's a great deal of open space. Uh, those. Uh, uh, the units are, as I said, 25 foot wide, 40 feet deep with a slot in between so that the middle rooms get light and air. And it's very much like a San Francisco model. All right, thank Any you. Other question? One more. Yes. Nearby. So I'm going to ask you kind of a blunt question. As someone who's not a huge proponent of density, you kind of have me bought with this, and more so if they looked like the European style houses rather than the ugly blocks, but that's here, neither here nor there. If you can get someone like me interested in this, and I have a feeling a lot of people that I've spoken to that also aren't proponents of density, again, we like prettier houses, not blocks. Why isn't this all over the city more? I mean, are, as a developer, have you proposed this to a planning board? Are you coming up against issues within our system that isn't allowing for something that's this nice? Because- well, Thank you. Um, I've, I've been retired for a number of years, so I really don't know why it hasn't been happening. <laughs> Uh, but uh, it certainly seems reasonable. Yeah, I, it would be nice if this existed a lot more. <laughs> I know. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. Next up, John Pollock. And after John, we'll have Timothy Thomas. Good evening, uh, Mayor Jones, members of council, members of the planning board. Nice to see all of you. Um, this, is, uh, this is really an amazing opportunity. I think you all realize that. You want to do something great for the community as a whole. You want to do something that's also wonderful for the, for the neighbors. And I am a neighbor. I live right there in Newlands. I've lived there for 32 years. And it's really been a great place. I, I brought my, my younger daughter home from the Boulder Community Hospital there and just walked home from the hospital. I also walked home from my appendicitis. Um, <laughs> and uh, I really appreciate that you've been listening to everybody. There are a lot of divergent views and there are legitimate concerns on all sides. I also think that there's some, 
some fears, and some of those are, are uh, not, probably not gonna materialize. I would say they won't materialize. There have always been fears when Martin Acres was developed, when Dakota Ridge was developed, when the Holiday Neighborhood was developed, and there have been concerns about what's gonna happen to my property values, what's gonna happen to crime, what's gonna happen to schools, what's gonna happen to traffic, and really all these developments are where many of us live now in the community, and it's all working pretty well and the fears really haven't materialized. Um, so I'm, I'm here to support the, uh, the staff proposal. Uh, <coughs> if anything, I think you can, as Paul was discussing, you can do great design and you can still get in a significant number of units. And um, if you go with smaller size units, then even the market rate units will be relatively affordable compared to the 3,000 square foot single family home down the block. So we'll be, cr we'll be filling a niche even with the market rate homes. And I would expect, depending on what kind of subsidy the city puts in, that you could achieve something parallel to the holiday neighborhood, which is at a 40% affordable, permanently affordable level. And that would be something to at least strive for. Um, so um, the, the last comment I have is about community character. And when I moved into the neighborhood 32 years ago, uh, there were working people, there were nurses, there were teachers. Not anymore. <coughs> the new people who are moving in all have to make a lot more money. And I think it would be great to restore some of that community character back to the neighborhood. Thank you very much. Thank you. Timothy. I'm kind of nosy. <laughs> Tim Thomas, I live in the city of Boulder. I've lived in Boulder since 1992. I live two blocks away from the Alpine property in a multi-unit building next to the co-housing on North Street. I don't own a car. I ride my bike every day. I am a car share member. <coughs> I've worked in the retail and service sector in Boulder throughout my 17, 27 years here. Most of the friends I've worked with over the years have moved out of Boulder because of its affordability issues. Rents rise every year, sometimes 50% in a year. I'm a single renter who yearns for the day that I can buy a home for my elderly blind mother, myself, and any future family I may have, if I could afford it. Much of that hope lies with you. My mom lives in the city-owned Boulder Housing Partners managed property on 35th and Colorado. She pays 30% of her social security check on rent, including utilities. The city first purchased the hospital with tens of millions of dollars of our tax money. I was and still continue to be skeptical that the property will be used for affordable housing. For years, I spoke before this council about the need of viewing policy through the prism of just sustainability, environmental protection, economic vitality, social justice, geographic equity, and procedural equity. Loss of use. The nearest housing to the heat of the property is a block, aw block away. I think that we will still see the mountains. Both city and senior housing organizations have built apartment buildings that are much higher than four stories. The dormitories on baseline are all over four stories. Senior housing on Adams Circle, Taft Drive, 1444 Folsom is all over five stories. The building across the street on Arapahoe and 11th is over five stories, life goes on. You can loosen the open space requirement due to the fact that the property is located across the street from North Boulder Park. <laughs> Lastly, this spring there was an instance of a black man being accused of not having the right to be on his own rental. I don't worry about that in my neighborhood. My neighbors know me, some of them are in here. I am no threat to them. We are no threat to you. Please help me make Boulder more diverse racially and economically. I've never been arrested in my life, never assaulted anyone in my life. When it comes down to it, do you want people like me in your neighborhood? Do you really want a diverse community? Look around. Doesn't look like it. <laughs> what will you do to change this? Thank you. Thank you. Mark Gilband and then Steve LeBlanc. 
Mark Yelban, 505 College. First, I want to thank all of the longtime uh, Newlands neighbors and Mr. Thomas for advocating for um, values that I believe are in the comp plan and values that all too often are shit talk in Boulder, quite frankly. So we're talking about affordability, and the city paid $42 million for this site. Am I correct? For $42 million. At 260 units, each unit before a shovel hits the ground, or not counting anyone's time here, is $162,000. 260 units basically amounts to what some consider low density and medium density and we're looking at a failed opportunity. So I'm up, up here to say that I don't believe staff's recommend, recommendation go far enough on density. I also want to remind everybody here that 55 feet is what the community voted on as the height limit in Boulder. The Boulder Rotto, the courthouse, the main building at the academy, Shambhala, some of the city's most iconic buildings are over 55 feet and nobody complains about them. They love them. So I would say we don't go far enough because just like Mr. Thomas just said, we've deferred to 40 or 50 of the most privileged, wealthy neighbors who complain the most and they're complaining about the notion of quasi-private parking on a public parking space that the entire community has paid for views, traffic, and they pretend as if a hospital wasn't there with over 4,500 emergency room visits and a helipad. There are 200 beds in the hospital. If we add 200 units, we're doing nothing. We've spent $42 million. We could have just remodeled the hospital and put 200 rooms up there. This plan compromises to the most privileged at all of the values that Mr. Thomas just spoke about way more eloquently than I can. So I would challenge all of you to look at yourselves in the mirror and stop complaining about someone else's taste. If you want different looking buildings, then hire designers with good taste and let them do their work and stop micromanaging them but stop pretending that we care about affordable housing if we're gonna put 260 units up there and they all cost 162K before we put a shovel in the ground. Thank you. Thank you. Steve LeBlanc and then Deborah Yin. Good evening, Steve LeBlanc, 443 Alpine. Um, I'm handing out a, f I did want to, comment on the petition that was uh, talked about from Think Boulder this evening. Um, this shows a type of material that was being handed out throughout the neighborhood, throughout some of my tenants. Um, I, I think a lot of people were scared into signing that petition, and I, uh, I was uh, not happy when I heard that people were actually in front of some of my businesses, I'm one of the owners at North Broadway Shops, handing out and getting people to sign this petition. So I think uh, any education we can provide to the public, uh, I think they'll get a better feeling for what's going on there. That a lot of, there's a lot of misrepresentations. Uh, tonight I'm gonna read a statement that was given to me by one of my friends, Henry Beer, who could not be here tonight. In part, he discusses his number one question that he poses to council candidates, but I think it applies to the affordable housing crisis that we have in Boulder right now. He says, I always begin with a question I address to anyone proposing to run for council. Help me understand how your policies and initiatives will make it possible for talented, ambitious, thoughtful, and community-minded young people to live in the city. For me, this is a seminal question. It trumps everything as it has precisely those kinds of people who up until a few years ago have made this place as magical and remarkable as it's become. I have no doubt that we can add intelligent density to Boulder with great planning, architecture, and design, bringing our densities a bit closer to those of the romantic and vibrant European towns everyone loves so well. 
There isn't a more environmental strategy than to concentrate people around their workplace. Doing so has a beneficial effect on transit and community building, enabling people who work here to live here. With that, they have a real stake in building a better, more diverse and vibrant community. Without young people, Boulder becomes a morbid enclave, a kind of well-preserved old corpse wearing expensive outdoor gear. <laughs> Henry's concern for providing our young people affordable housing seems especially poignant to me today after the impassioned speech by Greta Thunberg at the UN Climate Talks yesterday. Not only are we not going to provide our young people with a clean environment, but if anti-growth groups continue to scare people with misrepresentations, we will not provide them with a place to live. Alpine Balsam is the perfect location for dense, sustainable, green, car-free, living close to transportation, recreation, work, and shopping. My number one question that the anti-growth groups have never answered is, if not here, where? Suzanne. Thank you Thank very you. much. Uh, we have a question Steve. for you. Steve. Yeah. Um, why do you think this came from Think Boulder? I don't Actually, I have their information too. It's almost mirrored image. Because this doesn't, this isn't their information though, is it? Uh, that I you hand it out. This is kind of, I call this the baby brother of Think Boulder. Well, but okay. Right. Just to be clear, in terms of representing things, it says. Absolutely. But I'd be happy to show you the information from Think Boulder, which is almost identical to this. And I have that here if you'd like to see it. Thank you. Um, and Henry Beer, does he not own the property that were the old? Henry and I are partners over at the North Broadway shops. So he has a, a financial interest in that area across the street as well, right? Community Plaza, Community Plaza right. Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Deborah, and then Matt Frommer. Hi, Deborah Yin. I'm a neighbor to the hospital site. Um, how can you grasp the actual impacts of color patches and numbers with the out, without the assistance of 3D modeling? It would take a bit of time for one staff person to model the proposal, but the result would be understandable at a glance. Save everyone time, save us from unintended consequences. The success of the neighborhood, the holiday area is widely recognized with its density of less than 20 dwelling units per acre. It is also clear neighbors to the site would welcome this density, yet the city has proposed 50 to 200% additional density. Without 3D modeling, how do we know the buildings will look like Paul Saparitos or the earlier staff options? Often design concepts are fashioned in order to justify a client's objective. The Alpine Balsam design concept proposed the highest density and the tallest buildings at the core, tapering intensity to the edges. It's not coincidence the core is comprised of city-owned properties. This design concept was created to permit the client, the city, to shape our neighborhood to fit its objective to maximize development, a perversely opposite result from what we expected with the city's ownership of the hospital site. This urban design approach makes sense in many instances, but not here. In this location, more nuance is called for. It would be more fitting to create a core of low buildings, allowing views to be accessible for all, not just those living and working in penthouses. Thank you to council and staff for responding to public comments. I appeal to planning board and council to reduce the height of development along Broadway. In the northeast corner, um, limit height to three stories, 35 feet. Do not add to the height of the parking garage and limit the pavilion height to its current four stories. The public doesn't need a fifth story service center or public amenity where space, a pu public amenity space to appreciate the view. Many, many more of the public can see the view, the tremendous view from the ground now. Again, thank you for the opportunity to speak and for your hard work. Um, Deborah, Deborah <coughs> would you say again what the density is of the Holiday neighborhood? How many units it's to an less, acre? It's less than 200 units per acre. Less than 200? I mean, two, 20, sorry. Less than 20. 20 units per acre. Thank you. 
Great, thank you, Deborah. Uh, Matt Frommer, and then Michael Lachesi. Hello, my name is Matt Frommer, and I'm a resident of Boulder. Tonight I wanna to speak as a local resident of the neighborhood in support of the staff plan. I've been renting a townhome on Mapleton Avenue for four years now, and I love it. I've lived in, lived in over 10 cities, but for the first time in my life, I feel rooted in my community. My friends and I often reflect and share gratitude for the good fortune we have of living in this place. But as I move along through my 30s, many of my friends have decided to leave Boulder, not because they want to, but because they can't afford to stay here. As a community, we're losing smart, creative, and engaged young people to towns like Westminster and Broomfield. In my mind, this project at Alpine Balsam is an opportunity to address th these issues directly and to design a neighborhood that really embodies the core values of Boulder, inclusivity, sustainability, and affordability. I've been thinking about this site since 2016 when I designed a project in graduate school at CU for the Alpine Balsam site. I presented that project at a public CU event at E-Town in the winter of 2016, and we had a fantastic brainstorming session for the site. The point is, there's been plenty of public engagement on this, and it's time to move forward with a bold vision. In my view, much of the opposition stems from a crisis of faith in design. And I get it, there's disposable architecture all over Colorado. But in Boulder, we have the tools, the resources, and the process to get it right at Alpine Balsam. I believe that we can design a high-density residential and mixed-use project that enhances the existing neighborhood center and contributes to the beauty and diversity of place. It's important to have a critical eye, but this process works best when we all buy into a shared vision and contribute in a meaningful way. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Michael Lachesi and then Lisa White. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak on this and for your work in trying to get the best out of this very important site in our city. Uh, my name is Michael Lachesi. I live at 3055 11th Street. I've lived there for 26 years. Um, I'm part of the Babysitting Co-op Newlands Association Cabal that's just shown up tonight, so I'm glad to see some of my neighbors. Um, I also am a landlord of an ADU. I do believe that does provide some affordable housing. My tenant makes about half of the median income in Boulder, so that might say something. Um, as far as this project goes, I do support the staff recommendation uh, that you're considering tonight. Um, I do also agree with Francoise that we could go higher density here, but I think this is probably a good compromise and a good place to start. Uh, it is also a good use of the investment we've made uh, as a city, as a community, our tax dollars to acquire the property. Um, I don't think we need to see a conventional return on investment on this, but we do need to get good value for the money and time we put into both acquiring the, the uh, site and the process. Um, I, I do not support the community plan that some have discussed here tonight. I don't think that'll allow for nearly enough affordable housing on the site, and I also think that will make it very difficult to attract a, uh, a private developer, joint venture partner to get this done, because there's just not enough uh, capacity in there to make it happen. Um, also, I strongly agree with Mr. LeBlanc about this being a sustainable proposal, that uh, it's the type of development that can um, help uh, compact development, help reduce driving, lower carbon footprint, all that. And I really think it's uh, a good time to uh, be thinking about uh, living uh, in a more compact format for those who want to make that opportunity available. Uh, some of you may have read some stats in the paper recently, the amount of uh, the human, human footprint in Colorado has increased by the, more than the size of Rocky Mountain Park in uh, 18 years. Uh, that's a lot of that's a lot of development that's going out in the form of sprawl. You know, we probably all read about the, uh, the declining bird population in this country in the last 15 years. I mean, this is really human impact on the landscape. I think it's very important to develop on existing land which served within um, uh, designated communities, and that's that's a really smart land use. Um, so, in closing, um, I think this project, uh, as envisioned, could provide more social, more social diversity. Many have spoken eloquently on that, and I strongly support that. Um, uh, more sustainability and a lower car carbon footprint for our city during this time of climate emergency. So, thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. Um, Lisa White. 
and then we'll tour. Hello, Lisa White, and I live at 21st and Walnut. Um, I support a plan with a diverse mix of housing options, supporting 15-minute walkable neighborhoods and more, an increased vibrancy. And I'm really disappointed that we didn't move forward with the full area plan. I thought that the that staff did a really great job with the public process, and it was very thorough, and I was just really disappointed to see that not move forward. As others have said, we're in a climate crisis, and we also have a housing crisis, and what we're doing here is not enough. We need to be doing more. My partner and I work in Boulder, and we've made our home here. When we wanted to purchase a home two years ago, we were saddened to see that most of the options were single-family homes, and we didn't want a single-family home. We prefer not having to mow lawn, and we want to raise our future kids in a walkable and vibrant area that has shared spaces with our neighbors, and that just wasn't the reality of what was available for sale. Um, it worked out for us. We own a townhome at 21st and Walnut, and we love our neighborhood. It has townhomes and apartment buildings, a diverse group of people, and even some single-family homes. And we can walk and bike most places. Um, we can walk to retail and the transit center. We're about the same distance from the transit center in the main downtown core as Alpine Balsam. And um, we use our car about once a month and we've been considering getting rid of it and just switching to Ego car share permanently. And unfortunately, a lot of my friends aren't so lucky. Um, as I've moved into my 30s, a lot of my friends have started to leave Boulder and have bought homes in Lafayette and Louisville, and now I don't really get to see many of my friends. Um, so I ask that you please move forward with a bold vision that helps us work towards sustainability, affordability, <coughs> accessibility, and vibrancy, and allows more people to be able to make their home here who want to live in vibrant, walkable areas. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. We'll tour, and then Tom Volkhausen. Hi, mayors and members of council and planning board. Will Tour 3032 10th Street. I'd like to encourage you to adopt a plan that brings at least 250 homes to the Alpine Balsam site. I think the community-wide benefits are obvious. It's an opportunity to make a small but meaningful difference to help address our housing crisis, an opportunity to make a small but meaningful difference on transportation and greenhouse gas emissions by bringing more housing to the core of our community and an opportunity to be fiscally responsible and make good use of the investment that the city has made in this site. But I'm also speaking as a nearby neighbor. And I've watched my neighborhood change over the last 20 years as rising prices have really changed the character of the neighborhood. Homes are getting bigger, but the number of people living in them seems to be getting smaller. Mm -hmm. Virtually no young people are able to stay in our neighborhood when they grow up. By far the best thing I can imagine for our neighborhood is adding far more housing to that site and to other opportunity sites around the neighborhood. When I, you know, when I think back to when I moved here 20 years ago, and I think about the character of that neighborhood, I remember a neighborhood that used to have far more working class neighbor residents, a neighborhood that embraced and supported adding significant amount of affordable housing through Boulder Housing Partners next to the North Boulder Rec Center a neighborhood that supported the city in bringing overflow housing for the homeless to the North Boulder Rec Center during the time period that we were citing the homeless shelter, and the neighborhood that created the original neighborhood EcoPass program. The staff plan is very much compatible with the character of the neighborhood that I moved to. From a transportation perspective, it's hard for me to think of a better place for housing right along the skip route, across the street from a grocery store, coffee shops, and one of the the best ice cream places in town, walking distance to preschools, elementary school, middle school, and high school, walking distance to downtown and the transit center, and just a block away from our major north-south bi bike route on 13th Street. This is a perfect location for car light development with minimal parking. I'd also like to speak to beauty. While I loved having a hospital uh, in my neighborhood, and, you know, I, I also walked back, walked there when I thought I was having a heart attack, which luckily I wasn't. <laughs> it was a great, great amenity, but it certainly wasn't beautiful. I can say very confidently that the redevelopment of this site 
it will make our neighborhood more beautiful than the existing cracked uh, parking lot and helipad that have been there for many, many years. So please help make the neighborhood that I and many of my neighbors live in a more livable, vibrant, and sustainable place by supporting the staff plan and adding a significant amount of housing to the Alpine Balsam site. Thank you very much. Thank you, Will. Tom Volkhausen, and then Claudia Hansen. Oh, I always, how do you say your last Hello. name? I'm Tom Volkhausen, and I've lived in the Dewey Alpine neighborhood for three decades. And I'm gonna read what I wrote, but I don't, I'll get to the end. Can you grab the mic? Yeah. Okay, sorry, thanks. Um, I'm speaking tonight to support the Dewey Alpine Balsam Draft Plan, along with the maximum possible number of housing units. And I wanna take a quick detour to respond to the question that Council Member Nagel asked about why we don't see beautiful, fine-grained, European-style urbanism in Boulder. It's because it's illegal in the vast majority of the city. Over 80% of our residential land is zoned single-family only. It makes it real hard to do fine-grained urbanism. And that leaves 20%, and in that 20%, maybe a few percent would allow you to build the kind of beautiful things that uh, Paul Saperito showed. And also speaking to that, if you do go to Think Boulder's website, you'll see the Alpine Balsam Project as an ugly gray blob with no windows and no definition hovering over Alpine Balsam. I think that what Paul Saperito presented is much more realistic as far as what will actually occur on that site. And I think what Think Boulder puts up is basically a scare tactic. And scare tactics work, and scare tactics produce opposition to affordable housing, but once the housing is built, the scare tactics are revealed as empty. Having lived adjacent to Alpine Balsam for more than three decades, I want to say that neighbors should not have a disproportionate impact on Alpine Balsam plans. With a $40 million public investment in Alpine Balsam and about 100,000 Boulder residents, every Boulder resident has about a $400 investment in Alpine Balsam. Decisions with a financial impact on every Boulder resident should be made by the whole city and guided by citywide planning documents like the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan. The Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan clearly supports dense mixed use with maximum affordable housing at central transit served walkable and bikeable location like Alpine Balsam. Low density suburban style development as in the so-called community plan, which I as a member of the community had no input on and I resent that term calling it a community plan without involving the community. Low density suburban style development at Alpine Balsam would directly conflict with the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan. I doubt there is any representative for the 60,000 daily auto in commuters in Boulder here tonight. So I want to speak for their interests in the interest of everyone who breathes their exhaust as the Front Range has declared a serious ozone non-attainment area. Every reduction in the number of units at Alpine Balsam is an increase in the number of people driving into Boulder every day. Currently, almost all lower income workers at Ideal, Pharmaca, et cetera, cannot afford to live in Boulder, but instead must make long auto commutes often in old, high pollution and not very safe vehicles. Every unit at Alpine Balsam is an opportunity for one of those workers to walk across the street to work. The argument that only two or three story buildings at Alpine Balsam match neighborhood character is specious and incorrect. Three and four story ap Alpine apartment buildings have been adjacent to Alpine Balsam for decades, and the hospital has been taller than 60 feet for many years as well. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Um, Claudia, and then, Lynn, oh, I'm sorry. I wondered if either Chris or Jean could talk about those four ugly blobs and where they came from. Okay, how about at the end? Okay. Come on up. Thank you, Council. Thank you, Planning Board, for being here. My name is Claudia Hansen Theme. I live at 4726 16th Street in North Boulder. Um, I'm disappointed tonight that this council, after a lengthy and robust public process, is proposing to shelve most of the land use recommendations of the Alpine Balsam Area Plan. Obviously, we'll be rezoning the hospital site, and here I think more housing is better. But punting on the rest shows what I think is a lack of vision and leadership. Somewhere along the way here, we got lost in the weeds, in parking, traffic counts, and roof lines and I'm not interested in litigating those things. Planning is about looking forward and shaping what we want and need from our neighborhoods and cities over the time scale of a generation or more. And we do it because we know that populations, economies, ethics, and environments change. They never stand still. 
We're having this hearing in the middle of a week that activists around the world are devoting to communicating the urgency of climate action and climate justice. Our world is changing. But here we are struggling to imagine that people may want and need to live differently in the future. When we feel uncomfortable, we prefer to affirm the status quo. And that may be human, but that is not planning. The boulder that my children will inherit will need modest housing and more of it in central locations. It will need the density, and I use that word deliberately, the density of people and destinations to support walking, biking, and transit use. And it will need a rich and vibrant public realm that helps build and strengthen community. We don't have those things now in most places because we didn't plan for them 50 years ago. And we won't have them in the future if we don't plan for them today. With a large city controlled site to anchor it, the Alpine Balsam Area Plan was and still could be a unique opportunity to chart a needed future for Boulder. I ask that you move forward with the entire proposed area plan as staff proposed and not just its most expedient parts. Thank you, Claudia. I'm Lynn Siegel. Lynn Siegel, um, five, uh, or sixth and Dewey. Um, the density of this kind of a situation here is precisely why I am not voting for open space for the first time since I've lived here in 1987. It's time for development to pay its way. Now, I love Greta Thunberg as much as anybody else, but it's how we get there that's the issue. Now, this is my budget, my money, my city, and this is not the way to spend money on affordable housing. First of all, we're never gonna build our way out of it. We all know that. Second of all, what happened to the area plan when the hospital was decided to move to a different place? What happened to the overall area, all the area plans in Boulder? Why aren't we putting affordable housing in South Boulder next to the closest corridor for bus to Denver? Performing Arts Center should be in the hospital site. The medical pavilion, you should either sell it off or use it as it is for city offices. No $58 million to fix it up. We don't need that. This is a high, high, high price wealthy community that's trying to stick that wealth back onto me. And I'm just an ultrasonographer. I'm not a high priced person here. The Coburn development across the street from the hospital, the penthouses on Washington School, those are what pay for affordable housing, right? You know, what happened to 21st and Pearl, where we had community services, like the yoga center, dance place, put those in the center of town, because Boulder is a unique place on the face of this, you know, continent. It's small and it's not gonna get cheaper no matter how much you build. So put it out as far as you can because that's where my $42 million is going. It's gonna go a lot further out east. This is the north-south the north -south corridor and we can't congest it anymore. We're gonna kill the golden goose if we put density in this area. And make me want to pay for open space. Make me. Thank you, Lynn. Is there anybody else? Okay. Well, we're gonna close the public hearing. I wanna thank everybody for taking the time to come down here and for all the emails we've been getting. Um, before we disappear, are there any more questions? So, <clears throat> I wanted to thank everyone for coming down as well and communicating, because that's, um, I think, a really important item that we all have to address from all sides of the, from all sides of the coin. And I think I remember those four ugly blobs that someone was talking about. And it was the representation that staff first gave to us, and it was just a, um, Question. supposed to be representative. Is that correct? 
Jean, do you remember, am I? Uh, right, we've had a number of um, images. So I the think first. the ones that you're talking about were actually not created by staff or our consultants. We went through a number of scenarios um, in the fall that, was sh that were shared with the community and with council that were um, fit tests, massing diagrams right. to, to, with, with some very soft articulation. And, and even at that level, it was very hard for folks to envision um, what is that, envision it as an example of what it could be without being an actual site plan. So then with the next rounds of things, we, we tried to talk more about colors with lots of examples of what it could look like. So um, it, we recognize that it, this is a, it's a difficult process for folks to envision what it's gonna be like when it still has, has a lot of potential um, for, for differences um, in the types of units. So um, we hope that what we've provided in the plan with the prototypes and the descriptions and the number of um, different images of what things look like, it helps to illustrate that range of what things look like um, instead of being just sort of massing blobs because well, oh. that's really hard for folks to understand. Thank you, thank you for that. The, you're right, the amorphous blob that we all saw at the beginning of this process. Thank you. So I have Mary, Aaron, and then Mirabai. Oh, okay. Are you talking, sorry. Cindy, are you talking about the image that Mr. LeBlanc showed us? Something. Something close to that. Okay. That we, the council was given, and, and it was just supposed to be representational, but they were, there were no windows, there were no. Okay. It was just the massing. Because this, this image here, is taken out of an August 3rd email from Deborah Yin, from an email that she sent to council that said, please find the attached, please find attached the result of hours analyzing redevelopment plans for the Alpine Balsam site. I hope you find it informative. Thank you for your time, Deborah Yin. And then if you click on the PDF, that image comes from her PDF. So, no, but this was, oh, I wasn't referring to this so much as just the, what it was that I think that the whole council and maybe planning board saw in the first iter very first iteration of this <laughs> process. Okay. Okay, Mary. So my question was gonna be about why the plan didn't contain um, 3D um, models, and I think you answered it. It's because it's difficult, because it's so amorphous, and because it's about land use plan, not zoning. Can I call a quee on that? Oh, isn't it in the future we're going to get 3D? Um, aren't we? Isn't that one of the tools we're going to to try to use? I, I Just I know it's not relevant to tonight, but I thought that was one of the things we're going to do to add to our public engagement process. Is that right? Yeah, we're trying to work on uh, um, an approach where actually we could have a 3D model of the entire city, where then we could start to be able to understand how would things fit into the context. Um, I think we still um, will have um, uh, a communication um, challenge, maybe is the right word, um, of they're, they're still just blocks. They're not the fine-grained, rendered, mm. actual look of buildings. And so it's a tool in the toolbox amongst multiple tools um, that I think we can use as a part of engagement uh, as we have conversations in, in the community in the future. Thank you for that. Mary, are you done? Yeah, I am. Yeah, yes, Aaron. Um, yeah, so a question for you. So I know we uh, I took out some of the references to unit counts uh, in the plan. And can you just tell us what's left? Is there anything regulatory uh, left in the plan or specific number unit counts that would be required to be uh, compliant with? Yeah, I mean, I think if you look at, and I'm, I may need you to clarify when you at, say the word regulatory. Well, so I know this isn't quite regulatory, but like the guidance kind of thing, right? So yeah. if somebody came in and um, and they proposed something that had 80 units and that would push us to 227, is there any place in the plan that's like, oh, 225 is the maximum, so therefore that's not compliant with the, the area plan? Yeah, it's more about if you look at the land use prototypes that are described in the plan, that's where it really describes what's the intent of building form and units. The There is that estimate of total units that's really just based on math. Mm -hmm. um, 
So it's a range, um, but it isn't uh, like a regulatory requirement or something like that. Can, can you point us to the uh, language in the plan on those, those uh, land use prototypes, please? So we're talking like uh, page 27, for example, has mixed use two, or th th that's the area we're talking about here. Yeah, right? so it starts on page 23 of the plan um, for the residential areas, and that those are the land use prototypes that we were referring to, where it talks about what's the intensity, or, or the intent, I mean, um, of each of these different areas, and has the precedent imagery of yeah. what, could, what could buildings look like in those areas. Great, thank you, because I think Mirabai raised a good point earlier that uh, you know, there, so in other words, if somebody came in with something beautiful and interesting uh, that maybe had a few more units but was no higher, um, that that could be supportable within the context of the area plan. Yeah, and I think that was also a comment that the planning board discussed um, back in in um, August of, hey, when you think about crafting the zoning for this area, use some of the other tools in the toolbox rather than just a dwelling unit per acre tool, because it may actually result in outcomes you aren't looking for. Great, thank you. Mayor Bye. So I just wanted to go over some of this with what the two speakers, um, Paul Separino said, and then the other gentleman. It wasn't single family zoning. That's not at all the issue I'm bringing up with boxed, ha you know, boxes, but stuff like what's being developed on Junction or now out by across from the airport is that they're square boxes. And so based on what we're going to be doing here, are we going to be able to get more of this European style look? Or is there hurdles in the way that's going to prohibit and we're going to end up with, even if they're spaced apart more, but still boxes? Because again, I think you're going to get a lot more buy-in um, from people who are not as interested in as high a unit count if it could be beautiful and look more like Europe than boxes. And that was the intent with the additional um, building height. Um, the combination of the building map and also the, the description within the prototypes to try to aim for some of those building forms that are um, less boxy. Okay, so it's not like there's any, I mean, because that resident alluded to the fact that it's not allowed, but he's talking about single family and that's not at all what we're discussing here. So that style is allowed in, in that zone, correct? And, and when we move to develop the zoning that's specific to this, that, that's what this, this will inform. Great, thank you. And, and just when you say additional building height, that's like in the height map where it says 35 feet, except uh, you could go above it for pitched roofs, yeah. right? Yeah, thanks. No, okay. Sarah. So I was really struck by um, the opportunity for a, f to reach a level of um, housing if the county building isn't there. I mean, I was really s struck by the fact that there's, you know, uh, at least tonight, um, the folks who came to speak talk about wanting the, lar the higher number, and that that's possible if we don't have the county building. And I'm wondering if there is a way to create a criteria that, uh, regarding the, the county building question that um, values those additional units in some way that um, we may not currently be giving a, a, a value to uh, for the purposes of um, a walkable, more uh, dense uh, uh, part of the new part of this neighborhood. I can, I, I can at least chime in a little bit of, that's part of what we tried to get at in terms of the first criteria on the list on page 14, um, is um, how do we make sure that if, if there's a county building located here at Alpine Balsam and their property at Iris and Broadway redevelops, how do we make sure that we're getting not just the same but more housing? We're getting a better outcome for our community in terms of housing um, if we were to take this, this uh, this option of having the county lo located at Alpine Balsam. So we were trying to get at it through there, um, but what I may have been hearing from you, and you correct me if I'm wrong, is um, is is there a different way to value that? I, I think that is what I'm trying to say without knowing 
how how we would do that, but the sense of having a a complete a complete new neighborhood. Um, I, I mean, that's what I heard from a lot of people. Whatever one's position might be on how much housing or how, how many dwelling units, but that sense of a complete neighborhood uh, and the county building is is sort of would put, would um, inhibit the opportunity for that. Sam. So just a couple things. <clears throat> I want to say up front that I regret not being able to stay and participate in the planning board discussion because <laughs> it would be nice and wonky to be able to work through this kind of stuff together with the planning board. So I hope you guys have a good discussion. Um, to get to your point, Sarah, staff's first criteria, I believe, <clears throat> is going to make sure that we will get materially more housing if we do the, the land swap with Iris and Broadway, or however that transaction applies. And it's really only a few blocks away. So does staff view, I mean, I hear what you're saying about a complete neighborhood, but would staff view this as a complete neighborhood with the county building there? And how would you think about it in relation to what would be a block or a block and a half away? I think there would still be, there'd still be housing there. And I think that there's still more work to be done to understand what services exactly, like what's the combination of services, what would be the combination of um, community spaces, what would be then the balance of other types of units. And I would foresee that this, um, that further definition of this criteria would be something that our working group would um, delve a little deeper into to try to um, understand that, try to, try to shape that criteria a little bit more. And have you shared more widely with the community that this working group is coming, that this kind of process group is, or the, the discussion with the county, the working group with the county, is that something that's been shared with the public? I mean, outside of the decision we made? In the discussions that we've had with the, with the community groups, um, but we haven't done any kind of wide announcement yet. We're anticipating that we'd like to make sure that that gets scheduled and we understand the scope and and breadth of that work, and then we can um, do, well, we have discussed with the county to make sure that we have a good um, communications plan between the city and the county for this effort. Thank you. Okay, any more questions before we get out of the planning board chair? <laughs> okay, well, thank you to staff, thanks to the public for coming to talk to us, and we're handing over the reins to the planning board. All right. Thank you guys, good riddance. It's been fun. Okay. <laughs> um, That's what we're saying to you. Let's give ourselves uh, 15 minutes just so we have enough time to let staff turn over easily and for you guys to have uh, enjoyable yeah, exit. Are we gonna be able to set up yeah. our smoke machines and strobe lights again? <laughs> Make wise choices. <laughs> good advice. <laughs>
Do we have every we need? Okay. They're coming, Chris. Welcome back, everybody. Um, I don't have a gavel, so I can't bang anything. But um, so now that we've heard from staff and their presentation and public comment and shared some time with city council, uh, it's time for us to deliberate and um, take action or not. Um, but so before we, we really fully move into deliberation, I just want to give everybody a quick opportunity. If you have any essential questions that are germane to making a decision tonight, um, let's take a quick second and ask those of staff if we, um, if we have any of those lingering. Yeah, I just had a clarifying question that wasn't worth bringing up before the public's um, uh, talk period. Um, okay, so page 12 and page 18. I'm sorry to do this to you all. Um, on page 12 in this, uh, in the um, chapter, the main, the first map in chapter two key components, the northeast block is uh, labeled flex use, civic, or mixed use. And then on page 18, it just says mixed use two with no civic option. And my recollection from the city council meetings, which I sat through both of, was that the civic use for that building was taken off the table. And I could be wrong, but I just wanted to clarify because there's an inconsistency there. So, and I think what I heard was that they weren't interested in a full civic use there. Um, and the way that the plan portrays this is to allow some flexibility to allow, to allow the facilities master planning work to continue. Um, knowing that it, the intention is that it's some sort of ground floor um, commercial or retail types of, type of use, mm -hmm. could be housing, you know, likely housing above, a mixed use kind, kind of thing. Whether that has a tinge of civic use to it or it's a completely separate thing, that's why we wanted to um, allow that, you know, to describe it as a flex um, parcel at this, within the plan because we don't yet know that. Okay, thanks for the clarification. I appreciate that. Any other questions? Nope. Okay, great, seeing nothing. Um, who wants to kick us off with, uh, with a discussion of this uh, area plan? We don't have uh, key issues, but we do have a motion on the uh, screen for us to, to use to frame our conversation. Or someone could make a motion. Harmon. So um, the first thing I, I'd like to say is I, I I personally am not interested in nitpicking anything. Um, and if it were up to me and I was king of the planning board or the world or whatever, uh, the discussion would be limited to, are we going to say thanks but no thanks to the limitations that were imposed on um, what we recommended uh, when we heard this um, proposal last? and send it back to city council with essentially the whole plan that, um, that we had looked at, not this truncated version, or do we send it to city council with the plan as recommended by staff? Because I think at this point it's way too late to be wordsmithing or adding new little pet items. Um, so really, you know, I heard a lot of members of the public say, uh, great job, but it doesn't go far enough. Um, and so I think for, for me, the question is really just uh, go back to the full-blown uh, land use changes over the entire area or agree with the staff proposal and, and, rec and, uh, and vote to approve that as one of the two bodies required for approval. Peter, you look like you were gearing up to, to speak. Not yet. I was listening and... Okay seeing the difference between the two and how we have, well, you said it was recommended by staff, but after it had already been basically imposed, so to speak, yeah, by council. I mean, there's history there, obviously, but this is the staff recommendation in front of us right now. Mm -hmm. Other thoughts on that? Uh, so in general, I agree that we <clears throat> could, um, uh, ultimately vote yay or nay on the whole thing, but I, and I don't want to consider this nitpicking. I just m had some additional questions or thoughts that might, that I thought might be useful to, to uh, 
at least raise for the possibility of adding back in, um, two of which had to do with the county hub so you said, question. Would, would you mind just responding to the question that Harmon was asking? Because I think I'm just kind of moving us Great. forward on the kind of macro question of, is there other, are there other members of the board who are interested in trying to reset back to the area plan that we saw before? Or is everyone comfortable moving and discussing this one just to, before we start discussing it? Uh, so the question being just the hospital site versus the entire mm -hmm. area plan, uh, I, I would say just the hospital site since that's what city council directed us to do. Okay. Is that accurate? Yeah, that's not, that's not accurate. We, we have equal authority to yeah. approve changes to the comprehensive plan. They, they didn't direct us. Yeah, so they, I guess to correct that, they directed the staff to uh, alter the scope of it, I guess is a, probably a way to say that. So then we're not that. bound by that. Okay, so we can me, choose not to be bound by that. Okay, so let me answer it this way. The conversation, uh, I feel that the public conversation that we're having here tonight is bounded by the city council guidance and I would be more comfortable uh, uh, committing to that tonight. Okay, that's fair. Lupita, yeah. you're in agreement? Okay. Peter, do you want to weigh in on that? I think it's just going to make everything more expensive later to not deal with it now, but, um, and I think it was a, an example of really poor communication and of ignorance that the, everything that was put forth in the change was twisted on, twi I, I thought it was, it's, I wish we could fix that right now and go and re-explain what the point was of doing the area plan to encompass everything, to bring it in line. Uh, but having said that, I feel like it would just be um, picking another fight and trying to clean up all the blood as it is and get somewhere. I'll go ahead and weigh in. Um, I, I sympathize with that completely and I feel like um, you know changing the scope at the tail end of a project is a pretty unfortunate right way of running a public process, but um, that criticism aside, I feel like if we were to, I mean, just sort of on the one hand counting noses, there's not support for doing that, but on the other side, we really would be sending something to city council that they would then just reject and it would come back to us again. So I think <laughs> the ping ponging of that would just be inefficient and probably really rough on staff. So I think at this point, I'm, I'm kind of happy to sort of live with the situation, but kind of to go on record saying that it's not been the best process in terms of changing the direction at the last minute. Um, does that sound like an okay way to? Yeah, I, I can I can live with that. I I think to just expound a little bit on on some of the bad planning that I think is involved in in this truncated um, version of the plan. You know, this this notion of cascading density. Um, you know, it's a term that sounds good, but in fact, it bears limited relation to to actual good planning principles. You know, maybe if you lived in a vacuum on a flat plain. Um, you know, with an X, Y axis, you could say that the, the middle needs to have the highest density and we cascade down from that. But here we have a park that's a, a wonderful focal point and we talked about creating a, you know, a delightful southeast corner to that park where people could look across the park and see a place to get ice cream. And we, we're losing all of, of that, you know, which is, is really, planning, not just thinking about geometry, which doesn't overlay itself perfectly on the, the actual world. Um, so I, I'm, I'm with you, Brian, about not creating an inefficient ping-ponging process and counting noses, but, but I'm holding my nose at this moment in going in that direction. Great, thanks, I appreciate you putting that on the, on the record. Um, I'll avoid saying more on that. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and, and make a comment on the overall plan and kind of say where my position is. Um, you know, I do think that <clears throat> um, on the one hand, uh, a lot more could be done with the site and we probably are falling short in some ways of doing that, but I do feel like given the voices that we've heard and given the um, pragmatism that city council is facing in terms of, um, you know, something, the art of the accomplishable or the art of the achievable, um, we're probably ending up in an okay spot. Um, I think that the um, the design work that has been baked into the um, connections plan, the urban design plan, um, and all the documentation that's been done is really, really excellent and sets us up well for a great neighborhood, which is, I think is really the point of this for me. 
I'm much less concerned with the um, unit count than I am with the urban design character of the entire project. I think that's what we really live with uh, in the longest term. Um, and I know, you know, when you look at the plan, you know, it's, it's rectangles that fill up a whole block. But when you overlay the zoning, you have um, open space calculations and you have circulation patterns and all the other things that have to happen. So I know just from experience looking at this, it doesn't, it's not going to turn into these blocks extruded to a certain height. Um, but I think, you know, it makes a great argument for beauty. And we heard a lot of folks talking about that tonight. I really, really appreciate that. And if we do end up with a, a form-based code kind of approach, which I'm not sure that we need to, but some way for us to really um, key into uh, imagery beyond just the diagrams, I think is really essential. And, and it gives us as a board, based on the experience, like if there's a lot of rich kind of architectural imagery in there that helps us find our way forward, we can say this seems like it jives with that or it falls short. Um, even if it's not intended to match, right? We want to kind of cast a wider net and also really, you know, stick with the simple zoning parameters so we can call on designers to do a great job of designing the projects. Um, I really like that it's anticipating building or missing in this town. You know, we've got enough single family as it is. It's time to build the stuff that we didn't anticipate 50 years ago. Um, I love that it's in a sort of transit supportive mode where we're recognizing that if we really want to have transit, we got to support it by rooftops. And if you sit through any kind of um, transit meeting uh, with RTD um, and you talk about like, hey, I want, we've got this project over here and we think it needs to get a bus line, they'll say, once the rooftops are there, then we'll start talking. It's, you got to build it before they come in, in the transit world. Um, and I love all the talk of, um, diversity and inclusion, and I, I just, you know, what Tim Thomas said and some other folks uh, really struck me. We do need to look at ourselves really, really closely and figure out what kind of place we want to be. I personally, when I do that, I come to a different conclusion than what we've done in the past. Um, and I think this is uh, one of the places along with Boulder Junction that we're um, able to sort of like walk our talk at least a little bit, um, holiday as well. Um, I think there's one lens that we actually haven't looked at this through. Um, this is more of a comment to staff, which is an interesting one. Like when you look at these building typologies, you begin to get to a point where you're looking at elevated buildings, which means that beyond just the ground floor, um, you'll be finding that your quantity of accessible units goes way, way up. So in some ways, we're actually creating the potential for a real pilot project in terms of accessibility. I think the same thing's happening at Boulder Junction as well. And that's, some, that's a conversation this board hasn't really been charged with or had, but I think it's an interesting thing I want to just, you know, opine on for a second. Um, and, you know, in terms of creating a neighborhood that gets people out of the homes and into the neighborhood to connect with each other, um, that's what neighborhoods are, is the people who are connected with each other. And the work that we've done in lower income neighborhoods, the number one thing that people value is each other. They don't say, like, we really love our porches, or we really love our buildings, or we really love our parks. They say we value each other and we support each other. And that's, that's something that we can, as I think as a board, hopefully um, design for, design buildings and neighborhoods that are machines for creating community, as opposed to, to creating mach machines for creating isolation. Um, and then, you know, climate emergency, you know, it's time for us to uh, really do 100% of what we can as a city to do this stuff. And I really appreciate that, you know, this project I think goes in that direction. Um, everybody I know, and I'll do my like uh, traditional planning board thing, um, I've lived here for 20 years. Um, <laughs> almost everybody who I was friends with when I first moved here has moved out because they couldn't afford to stay. But they've kept their jobs here. They're the ones driving back and forth between other places in Boulder to stick to the same job. Affordable housing is a big contributor to the traffic that people complain about and to our carbon footprint. Um, and I think sometimes we're faced with projects that aren't really in the right place. You know, when we see a site review, we're sort of trying to, you know, somebody's trying to shoehorn in something that maybe doesn't fit in that neighborhood or maybe doesn't fit in that part of town or is too far from transit. This is one of our few places where we're like, the geography actually suits exactly what's happening here. So I'm really, really happy that we're able to do that. Similar to Boulder Junction, you know, there were a lot of big factors, access to train lines, the terminus of Pearl Street, things like that, BRT, um, that uh, influenced that. And I think the planning board of that era did a great job of recognizing that. Um, so that was my um, soliloquy that I'm offering up tonight. <laughs> um, and, uh, and I don't have any sort of, I'm not personally proposing any changes to the plan. I feel like um, 
just tactically, it's difficult for us, I think, to to uh, make a bunch of changes and then send it to, send it to city council. Um, just having been through this a bunch of times, it's a little easier if we just say like, this is something that we can live with. Um, and so that's, I'm not suggesting that you guys feel the same way, but that's my take on it is this is, this is really close to what's great. Um, and so any kind of like little tiny minutia that I wanna get into um, because I'm that kind of person, I'm uh, gonna restrain myself <laughs> once. So that was what, like 47 minutes of talking straight? Something like that. <laughs> We're somewhere in that range. We'll have a talk about brevity in our next talk. Who's next? <laughs> if I may ask a couple questions. So I'm just gonna zero in on a couple of details or specifics. So one, um, as we're looking right now, we're just looking at the, the city-owned parcels. And that's the site where we're talking about the potential for 250 and as we heard from a number of people here that they thought could even go higher. Would that still be in a possibility at this point if we said we're good for this or does this put a cap on the 250? No, it doesn't put a cap on it. What you're, what you're really adopting in the area plan is um, future land use and um, the intention of what you want redevelopment of that site to look like in the future, exactly how many units it is, exactly what the buildings look like, that all gets determined through the all future. Right. But a priority right now is higher density and that's, everybody seems to be on board for that. What that exactly is going to be, still gonna be some flexibility, that's one. The other one with regards that it came up a number of times is the whole issue about height. And just to be clear, that no matter what happens within this area, nothing's gonna be built above 55, because that is like, you get electrocuted in this town if you do. <laughs> um, so we're not doing that, and potentially lower than that. So for those people who are worried about it, that's not gonna happen. Is that, am I clear on that one? That's not gonna happen. That is correct, okay, crystal clear, can't go over 55 feet, down. period. So that's Van, gone. Van Halen. <laughs> Good. Um, and I think those are my, major, my, my biggie ones. I just wanted to clear those up. Cool, thanks. Anyone else wanna jump in with potential So um, I'm actually gonna go back to the height uh, question that I asked during the original, uh, during our original um, clarification segment. Um, so, so just can I, if I could make a request, could you make reference to the page numbers just so that I can follow along? Yes, thank uh, you. so let me, thank goodness I keep my notes this way. Yeah. Um, okay, so, let's see if I can find it. Um, hold on, I just have to find it. Um, okay. Uh, I'm just, I'm gonna kind of repeat what I said, er, what I asked earlier. So on page 12 in the Northeast block, it's written as 45 feet, but the proposed land use prototype of uh, MU2 allows 55 feet. On page 13, and it's reiterated on page 19 in the center uh, block, written as apartments along Alpine could be up to four stories that's written as 45 feet, but the proposed land use prototype is either HDR3 or public, uh, and that allows up to 55 feet. And then on page 61 of the area plan under implementation and next steps and the discussion of regulatory changes in the second bullet, uh, they talk about, the, you all uh, mentioned the possibility of needing to modify the height limit map um, that, 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 that may be necessary. So I appreciate, I really appreciated the, the conversation uh, that uh, ensued that this is solely for the purpose of um, being able to get different uh, roof lines, but I did notice um, that in the proposed community benefits ordinance, there was a recommendation that ultimately Alpine Balsam be added to Appendix J which would of course then allow the additional floor or floors uh, in exchange for whatever community benefits we determined. So I'm, I, I just wanna understand whether it makes sense 
in order to um, address the, the entire conversation that the neighborhood has been having, whether they're pro or against, um, to fix the, the land use prototype language so that the limits um, are really set, so that um, HDR3 and MU2 are set at 45, and very specifically you say only additional for um, roof lines, and that the um, max for HDR1 and HDR2 are set at 35, uh, so that we don't end up back in a circular firing squad arguing about we thought it was only gonna be 45 feet and now it's 55 feet. I, and I, I did hear what, Chris, I heard what you said about you know floor heights and stuff, but I, I just want us to try to not come back here a year from now when a developer has actually proposed a project and fighting again over the heights. And I don't know how to do that. So maybe I'll start with a, a couple of things, which is, um, Chris, before you answer, I can't find anywhere where it says 45 feet. Do you see what Sarah's talking about? Um, I was gonna, actually gonna ask that question as well. When you referenced 45, um, I wasn't sure, because I... Don't hold on. <sighs> All right. I have to find the... Right, I'm trying to find the, uh, what pages are the um, pr land use prototypes on? Can you just remind uh, me? They're in the 20s. In the 20s, thank you so much. Okay, so. Okay, dokie. Okay, so H, um, HDR1 uh, says building heights would be no more than 35 feet, which is great, uh, but again, referencing the uh, suggestion in, the, previ in uh, the proposed community benefits that ultimately this area be placed in the Appendix J. Then HDR2 uh, also says 35 feet, um, and, but again, the reference, my concern here is the proposed community benefits uh, placement of this area into Appendix J. Uh, then uh, HDR3 says this land, I'm sorry, on page 25, uh, which is the underlying zoning if the, if the, um, if the, host, if the um, county building doesn't go into that block. This land use is designed for housing up to four stories. Building heights would be between 35 and 55 feet to allow for a fourth floor and any ap appropriately portioned pitched roof forms. Um, so it's the 55 foot uh, there that I'm just trying to point out. And then the mixed use, I'm sorry, the MU2, which is on page 27. Um, this land use prototype is characterized by low rise to mid rise buildings from three to four stories. Building heights would generally be between 35 and 55, uh, with an exception of 35 to allow for a taller first floor, a fourth floor, and or to allow for a fifth floor of parking, which is specifically to the parking garage. So uh, this may just be language that to a lay person gets confusing, but the conversations have been about 40, you know, 45, 55, 45, 35, and 35 in those blocks. And I think uh, I just like to make sure that the mushiness doesn't let get to a, to 55 feet in blocks where we've been talking about 45 feet or even 35 feet. Kalani with the planning um, department. So I. So the Appendix J map is kind of an all or nothing thing. You get 35 to 55. And so what the plan does is it adds another layer in there. So it's not saying that everything can go to 35. What we'd like to do is add that nuance of, or go to 55, add a fourth floor nuance in there that it kind of gets an in intermediate control so not everything is hitting the ceiling. Does that it, it help? It does. And I think to, uh, to Councilwoman Young's point, 
floors and feet are different things, they and are. they're different things to the public. Mm -hmm. And I think the public is not thinking about floors, they're thinking about height. And, yeah. and uh, I, I th I'm just trying to get at how we can cl be really clear and uh, with that. I, I think when we're talking about that intermediate 45 feet, when we start to get a little bit in that arbitrary because of the way that we measure height, it, it makes um, mixed use buildings more difficult to have the different floor heights on the first floor and then floors above that. When you're standing at the ground in your perception of a building, it's really difficult to see uh, like a three foot difference or a five foot difference or a, a pitched roof and so that's why we were very specific on not assigning 45 feet as like a threshold because it could mean the difference between your roof form and not having a roof form. It could be your parapet or not being able to do a, an appropriately proportioned mixed use building with retail at the ground floor. And so that's when we were talking about the Appendix J and that's why you only see in the plan 35 or 55. And then we added the floors in to add that finer grain, that nuance in there. So as a and tool to achieve better design, and to achieve the outcomes of retail, yeah. first floor retail that may require a higher yeah. ceiling height, and if yeah. we got that, then we may end up with an ugly building on top, so then we added this provision to allow for some roof forms and some discretion in there. S some discretion, some better design, better proportion of the body of the building to say the roof of the building or the first floor of the building to the floors above. and. Um, it doesn't always necessarily, it may mean the difference. What we see a lot of is, you know, a, a two foot flexibility in that can mean the difference in several, you know, in the way a building is, um, you know, designed and proportioned and whether they are able to put in a pitched roof if they want one. And just to jump in on this too, yeah. a couple, couple of things. I mean, a current zoning, there are a lot of zone districts that use both floors and feet, right? Mm -hmm. That's very yeah. common in our zoning. Another question is um, this approach to um, talking about both floors and, and feed is in alignment with not just the current zone districts that we have throughout the city, but also with the practices that you guys developed for the Boulder Junction project and the form-based code mm -hmm. pilot there too, right? Yes. Okay, so that's, those are also in alignment with how we've been doing those things. So our, yes, you're correct. The, our zoning districts do have a floors and some of them, not all of them, but it will have a floors <coughs> and a kind of um, 35 foot height limit or a 55 foot height limit or 38 feet. There's a, a little bit of discretion in there. We just <coughs> thought for this early phase um, when we're trying to look at big vision and get the character and provide the design flexibility we, want, we didn't want to lock it into a 45 foot arbitrary number. We could definitely look at that more during the zoning and implementation as we get into whether it's form-based code or design guidelines, whatever the design controls are. But we did want to at least set the tone for what the design possibilities are mm -hmm. for the- I think Sarah unless, brings up a great point of the confusion that could come from something like this. So I think we should pay attention to it mm -hmm. and make sure that um, we get the design we want with this, but it's communicated in a way that doesn't open uh, the board or the city up to what are you doing now? And I think well, if, mm -hmm. if we've learned anything in, is that a lesson in uh, how, not, how not to speak in planning speak and how to break this down uh, for all of us will go a long way. So thanks for bringing that point up and I hope that we do get to deal with that. I know we'll get to deal with that <laughs> when, we, when yeah. we get there. Well, that'll happen. I have one last thing I want to say, and I think the uh, one of the things about Appendix J is that um, it does open the door to height modifications in the areas that are red, right? But those are still considered in the context of the area plan. So just because like the whole gun barrel town center uh, area plan is red, doesn't mean that actually all of that could go to 55. It's still controlled by the area plan, which is the same as the Boulder Junction um, form base code and area plan, because we've got a zone there where um, we mapped out uh, view corridors, uh, height differentials in different places and stuff like that. So while the whole thing is red on area J, or appendix J, um, the thing that controls is really the area plan. And then we would review site reviews in context, in that context. So it's mitigated by the stuff that's in here. Like Klein said, it's sort of an all or nothing diagram. The, the appendix J map, yes. Armin, you wanna chime yeah, in? Yeah, so I have a question for probably David and then just a 
point to back up what you said in your 47 minutes. Uh, David, uh, or staff if it's appropriate, um, the motion to me seems to have four superfluous bullets. Um, motion to adopt the Alpine Balsam Area Plan included in Attachment A seems to be enough. Carmen, I would agree on that. I think that's, I, I don't think you, the, the, okay. the bullets were really more to illustrate Okay. What's contained in the attachment? Okay. A? You, I don't think you need to. I, in your yeah, I, I agree. I think it actually confuses the issue. There, the changes in the bullets are already made in the plan. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for asking that. I so the same question. The second <clears throat> piece is just to say that, um, despite the issues that I have with the, the truncation of the land use changes um, that are uh, allowed underneath this plan, um, the other things like the um, design guidelines and so forth that are that are in the plan are plan-wide, and so I just wanted to, I, I think you said that, Brian, I'm not sure that it was as clear as I wanted it to come out, so I'm just adding that I, I appreciate that it's not a wasted planning effort for the three-fourths of the area that isn't proposed for land use changes anymore. I appreciate you adding clarity to what I said. It does not surprise me at all that something in there was not perfectly clear. Sarah? Um, so I did want to ask a couple of additional questions about um, the criteria for the Boulder County building, and that's on page 14. So has anyone, have we asked the question of how much it would cost to add an additional level of parking? Like what would it cost and who would be paying that? I think they said 60 spots. I don't know what 60 spots, five floors up. I think I know what it is, two floors down, and it's like 60 grand, two floors down. Hi, Michelle Crane, um, City Facilities Design and Construction Manager. Roughly speaking, we could get with that extra story about 60 to 80 spots, and it's uh, roughly $100 a spot, is a, so um, is an estimate. No. No. No, no, how much would it cost to build that additional floor? That's, yeah, so. What is it, whatever that math $100 is. $100 a spot? You mean 100000 100 No. $100 a spot? No. It's 30000 yeah. on the ground and 60000 yeah. one floor down. I always thought that was a rule of thumb, so I don't know what five floors up would be. Yeah, I'd have to, I'd have to go back and look at what that math is um, to get that. We haven't actually done a cost estimate so, on that. So my point in bringing this up was I wonder if this is a valuable criteria to add, the cost of adding the additional floor um, of parking for 60 to 80 additional <laughs> spots. I just think that's a useful. I think it's amazing that um, we would have the car, conceivably these are gas ca cars, that we loathe for their, how difficult they make it for us to reach our climate goals. And the other thing we loathe is building high, but we would build a pedestal on the fifth floor for cars to look at the mountains. <laughs> that would be horrible. And, and, <laughs> and it, it, so, so it, this connects to yeah. the other thing I wanted to say, which was something Brian brought up in the last planning board meeting, which was a criteria I thought we had all agreed to, on, which was would the county agree to a TDM um, and to get some of the county staff out of their cars. Um, and I don't see it in the criteria, and I'm not trying to make life more difficult for the city council, but these, those two items seem like really valuable criteria to add to the discussion about the county building. So I can um, try and address a little bit. Um, under criteria number three, which is where we talk about the county's need being met in the existing city-owned parking structure, what we're, I think, really trying to get at there is county, this isn't build a building and a surface parking lot that surrounds the whole building. Um, this is about how do we accommodate the parking in the way that we want to see parking accommodated um, in this geographic area. Um, so I think that's more of what we're trying to get at um, related to um, that, that criterion. Um, and then related to the, the TDM piece, I might l look to David and others, but that's typically something that we um, can also resolve through the actual development review process where we would have them put together a TDM plan. Yeah, that is correct, and and also at um, some of the prior city council meetings where the county staff has been um, available for questions and comments on the plan, um, they they have stated that their intention is to have um, a strong 
transportation demand management strategy for this property as they do with their, all of their downtown employees. If, um, if I can make a motion. Hold on. Just, I, haven't uh, I haven't had my chance to say anything. Oh, well, let's give you a chance. I know, I was waiting for it to come around. So I just wanna stop you before you can make your motion. The idea that this seems, I think this hits everything in the comp plan. And apart from the number of units and the height, there doesn't seem to be any actual complaint. And I think we're gonna get complaint worries on every project we do. I would like to see instead of the county building 55 feet touching up against the same height as the hospital and then going down a bit and tying into the central block because that's a great opportunity for some height and some units that'll subsidize a lot of the goals here and it won't block views of from the community and it'll provide for everything that the city building needs and it'll make this project a lot more financially feasible. The county does seem to get in the way. The, putting the building in doesn't seem to get us all the comp plan goals we want at all. So that does start to worry me, as well as the fact that there are more people in the city, in the neighborhood that need to ask, access city services than there are people who live around Alpine Balsam that need county services on a regular basis. To my knowledge, that's kind of an ignorant statement on my part because I don't know that for sure. Point is, I, I never really liked the idea of this land being for city services, but I'm okay with it now, and I think counties make, county makes it more difficult. I do think it is interesting, as someone said, this week that we have of news and consciousness that's burning in all of our hearts and our minds that, that we're even having this uh, discussion, and I respect the fact that there are neighbors who are concerned and uh, I've tried to empathize and consider how that does or doesn't affect whether or not this sits with the comp plan, and I, I can't see how this should do anything, we should do anything but approve this. And um, I hope that it gets uh, better as it goes along, then I know it will. Thanks, Peter. And I apologize for not calling right. on you before that. It's oversight. Uh, did you wanna? Yeah, and, and I'll just say, you know, the uh, I'll make a motion and, Fortunately, it'll be very brief, and if it obtains a second, then we can still entertain friendly amendments before the chair restates the motion as the motion of the board, and even after the chair restates the motion of the board, we can have motions to amend. So I'm just gonna get this out, and hopefully it'll cause us to have a more efficient, or have an efficient dialogue um, throughout the rest of this uh, item. So I move that planning board adopts the Alpine Balsam area plan included in attachment A of our packet tonight. Does anyone want to second that? I'll second that. Okay. Moved by uh, Zuckerman, seconded by um, Peter Vitale. Sorry, just a swat of beard hair. Um, is, is this where we offer a friendly amendment? Yeah, this is where we offer friendly amendments, yeah. So I would like to offer a friendly amendment about adding um, the cost of a fifth floor of parking to the criteria for um, the county building. And from a staff's perspective, is it okay to sort of have that motion be um, non-language specific? Uh, is that acceptable? Yeah, and maybe, Sarah, what I might ask is just to understand um, a little bit more. When you say cost, meaning that the criteria should say like, and the county has to pay for it, or that it needs to be cost effective, or well, just flush that out for me uh, a little bit more. So I think we need to know what it will cost. And I think we need to factor that into our thinking about um, the, the opportunity that may present itself at Iris and Broadway, because someone has to pay for that building, uh, pay for the additional floor of parking, and it's, it, it, we don't know a number, we don't know who would be paying, would that be county taxpayers, would that be city taxpayers, how does that factor into what we might ultimately get at Iris and Broadway? So I don't know, I don't know exactly how to capture that, but. Well, I could offer language if you, if you guys want to consider it, but um, I think that um, that this will come out in the negotiation that was described earlier in terms of right now that we are engaging with the county staff, 
uh, you know, with the commissioner and a couple of council members to kind of start to work out what this will look like. I think that the staff's position throughout has been um, along the lines of minimizing parking in this area. Um, on the other hand, the county has explained to us that they have um, a customer service delivery need. Um, they're working on what that is. Um, I am guessing that um, as part of that, if they need additional parking to deliver the types of services that they will be delivering at that site, um, that they would be paying for any additional parking. Okay. So, so if you guys want to put another criteria in based on parking, I'm happy to propose language. Do you, would you feel comfortable doing that in light of uh, not addressing the other costs in that deal, including sort of land costs and infrastructure costs and the sort of um, other opportunity costs that go along with that? It seems like we're kind of <coughs> pulling out one bit of cost without addressing the whole negotiation. I, yeah. The area plan is not a place where we've ever addressed land costs or... No, no, and I, I, I do think that, um, you know, we're not sure if there's a deal in there yet, and so that that's kind of the part of the working group is to see if there's a deal in there. Um, so a lot of things will be negotiated that, in that, um, and you know, there, are, you know, in terms of some of the analysis that, that has been so far, there's questions about the carrying capacity of the iris site given some of the historic resources, and um, so, but but all of that has to be worked out before we can really move forward on a deal. So my crystal ball says they're gonna, they're gonna get worked out. Um, Separately from the area plan. Yeah. And there's yeah. also questions of ownership, right? Is, is the county gonna own the building or is the city gonna lease it to them? Or are they, there's a bunch of questions that we don't really. Oh yeah, yeah, really and you know, when you talk about affordable housing on the Iris site, it's, you know, are they gonna develop it? Or is the expectation that the city and the, the city housing authority will do it? None of those issues have, um, really even been um, opened up a little bit yet. We're, we're just now starting to shine the light on it. Okay. And if I can chime in, and since I'm not sitting next to David, I can't see what his scribbles are for his idea. <laughs> um, but as Gene and I were, were sitting here, if you look at criteria number five mm -hmm. um, for county criteria, that's where we talk about, hey, we gotta work out how, who's gonna pay for land and how. But then we also talk about the county's participation um, and cost share agreements related to other public infrastructure operations and maintenance and parking. And so I think it starts to get there, but if we wanted to, that might be a place to put language and put the words parking structure or additional parking in the parking structure. If you wanted to get specific, that might be another place to put it. I, I, I don't see a downside to getting specific, and it does seem like, I mean, to Peter's point, uh, adding a adding a floor of parking to, ca to a car, to, for cars, when what we're trying to do is build more housing, seem, and, and we know from previous conversations that if the county goes in, then we lose some of our parking opportunity for the housing we want to develop. It, I just think it's a, I think it's a, I think it's useful to know that information. It doesn't have to, uh, and because the tool we have to put that in there is a friendly amendment, that's why I'm using the friendly amendment. So, um, not trying to gum up the works. I just feel like this is a really valuable piece of information that needs to be surfaced for it, part of the decision making. If it helps, I think that it's not just the parking, it's the whole building. The whole? The whole building that we're gonna lose to the housing. So I think it's a conversation that's gonna continue and we're gonna hear from the county or not, <laughs> and need to move forward. So I think it's more than just the parking garage. I think it's a global issue over the, what's gonna happen there. I think we'll have opportunities to visit that. But going on Harmon's point, to keep the process going of something that council can work with. Um, I think, uh, yeah, I mean, it's your motion, it's your friendly. So uh, just I'll speak to it just really briefly. I, I don't feel like there's, I kind of agree that there's no harm in adding something like that to it as long as it doesn't come up with negotiations. So I, I'm, I'm not at all opposed to it. Um, I do kind of feel like it's worth just looking at item five and saying, you know, is this adequate? Um, and is there something that's missing? And if the city and county 
um, are already determining appropriate fair compensation and they're considering um, that related, related to land cost, public infrastructure, operations and maintenance of the site and parking. Are there things that aren't in there that need to be? And it, if you want to add, you know, um, building modifications or, um, you know, new construction or um, parking structure or stuff like that, maybe those are things that you could stick in there. Um, it wouldn't be the kind of thing that would make me not vote for the motion, but right. also I'm, yeah, I don't and feel I'm not strongly trying about to it. Not, I'm not, this is not an unfriendly amendment. Um, mm -hmm. And I think the first sentence really talks, the first sentence in number five is really referencing the value of the, land, the two land spaces that might be swapped. Um, and the second does seem to try to get at um, uh, the other elements. Um, uh, and I, here's what I think. You guys know I care about what the cost would be. We don't need to have a friendly amendment for that to be conveyed into the task force. I think that's fair enough. And, and maybe if we could okay. just kind of have the record reflect, if you're okay with that, totally. that when we have the word parking in here, what that means is it means the parking and the parking garage. Yeah, right? it's it means an inclusive term, things. not a not just yeah. surface parking. Yeah, task force is a great place to make sure that's heard. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we can we, carry that back if you'd like us to do it that way. I would appreciate it if you do that. Thanks. Good. Good discussion, guys. I appreciate that. Um, Lupita, I just want to see if there's anything you want to add to this because um, I want to make sure you get heard. Uh, not necessarily to the criteria thing, but to the overall motion. No, I think the uh, what I was listening to the when I was listening to the conversation, I'm very comfortable with really uh, with dealing with ranges. I do that regularly. So, 35 to 55 is part of what lang language I use. So, uh, gives you flexibility. I think that makes sense. Um, the I think the point was important, but I think it is included in here. And as long as the word is there, and the task force has to be made aware that that was because of the co-location with county, you know, I'd rather see all homes. <laughs> but yeah. yeah, I guess we have to work with this and we'll see just how much it will happen. It may not happen. Yep. Cool. Okay, I guess I'll go ahead and restate the motion so it becomes the board's motion. Um, so uh, motion by Zuckerman, seconded by Peter Vitale. Um, I don't know why I'm giving you just the last name and him, him both, but I guess he gets You have both. to differentiate him from all the other Vitales on the planning exactly. board. Yeah, it's true. Too many Vitales going around. Uh, There's a motion to adopt the Alpine Boston area plan, including in attachment A with the changes outlined per direction from decision-making bodies. Do you guys want to speak to the motion or should we go for a vote? Yeah, I think the, the motion was just to adopt the area plan included in attachment A. Okay, sorry. Walk that back. Thank you for the correction. Welcome. Um, so do you guys want to speak to the motion or should we um, call a vote? Oh. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and call a vote. All in favor of the motion? Aye. Aye. Okay, the board passes that unanimously at 9.00. Wow. Oh, good job. Good job, everybody. Good job. Good job, you guys. Um, this has been a Herculean effort, and I know we're just at the beginning of it, and you'll be back in front of this board 27 more times on the same subject, so can't just wait to see Don't change those, those, uh, window, those windowless blocks. That's what I yeah. want. Yeah. Lego town. <laughs> Put some windows on those blocks. <laughs> All right, Cindy, do we have any other items on our agenda for tonight? Do we need to talk about calendars or... No, our next meeting's next Thursday, October 3rd, and um, I just know that Brian is not going to be here. Yep. I think David will be actually be here. Yeah, David's coming back for that, and I'll be recusing myself because of involvement with that applicant. Um, so Harmon will be running that meeting, and it'll be great. Early That's Hall it. That's early all I got. Halloween dress-up meeting? I think so. Okay. For Harmon. Very early. <laughs> oh, oh, please do. Peter usually dresses up for all October board meetings. <laughs> if you could come ready with Take any changes you might have to the board and commission questions for the application, if you have any. Run. Uh, that was on the packet. Um, and because I need to submit those to the clerk's office sooner than later. Was this just for next meeting? Yes, it was confusing. Um, 
since I'm not going to be here, I'm just going to make a comment on the uh, boards and commissions app application. I think there should be something in there that uh, telegraphs attendance expectations so that that might be a little bit more clear. Okay. Okay, fake gavel. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Live from Paris, on France 24.